So I would like to call the meeting to order. It's 7.03 um, by my clock. And um, let me first read the, uh, read the notice as required. Um, so this George, meeting is, George, yes. Do you, to, do you want to see if Nancy's going to come in? Because she should be taking minutes. Yeah. Well, it's being recorded, so she can always just watch it. Yeah, yeah we'll have her catch up there. She, uh, Nancy should be joining us momentarily. I know she's in another meeting also, but. Okay. But um, so let me start again. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternative, uh, as an alternate means of public access pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with MGL uh, C 30A section 20F so that the chair may inform all other participants, participants of said recording. Is anyone else recording this meeting? Hearing none, I will move to the next item on the agenda. The comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda. Hearing none, seeing none. Um, is, uh, has Nancy joined us? Uh, she has, I, I, I see. Yes, yeah. So the next item, uh, Nancy, would be the approval of minutes. Yes, I distributed um, the revised meeting minutes from the 4th and the 11th. This evening, there were um, relatively minor changes. Do you want me to walk through them, or is everybody comfortable with what they saw? Sounds like they're all comfortable. I don't see anybody raising hands, so um, get a motion. Move to approve the minutes of January 4th with uh, as revised uh, by our uh, honorable secretary. <laughs> Second. All right, uh, any comments? No? Okay, then we come to vote. So, um, Bob? Aye. Uh, Nancy? Aye. Dave? I'm gonna abstain. Uh, that's right, you were not here. Um, has Evan joined us? I know he was in the selectmen's meeting. Right, okay, Andy? Aye. Uh, Dave Aline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Has Al joined us? He may still be in the other meeting. Uh, Tina? Aye. Matt? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. And Sarah? Aye. Okay, now I lost count somewhere along the line. Did somebody get it for me? Um, I did not. But one, two, three, four, five. I think it's ten zero one. Would that be right? That sounds right to me. Yeah, I'll take that. Okay, Nancy, you have another set of minutes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Um, for um the eleventh. For January 11th, um, and again, that was a revision that was sent out earlier this evening. And uh, I think it was only in section five where there was more than, I'm just like, oh, and I'm sorry. And uh, in the ACES education, just a clarification on um, the collective bargaining, bargaining agreement. Okay, do we have any comments from any of the members on the minutes? 
Hearing none, um, do we have a motion? Move to approve the minutes of January 11th, 2022 as revised by our secretary. Second. Okay. okay, we come, we come to vote. Uh, Bob? Aye. Uh, I am an I also. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Steve. Uh, as Evan joined us, anybody see him? All right, Andy? Aye. Daveline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Still, still missing. Uh, Tina? Aye. Matt? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Okay. All right. So I have three, uh, seven, ten. Oh, I have eleven. Yeah, eleven zero one. I have. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have um, a few budget hearings to go through this evening. And uh, fire is first in line. And Tina has the lead on the fire budget from the public safety group. Okay, and I see we have the chief with us. So uh, welcome Chief Murphy. Thank you. Uh, um, great. So I am going to, I figure I'll start this out run through the numbers and let the chief take it from there. I think he um, <laughs> has definitely um, a great handle on this budget this year uh, as he probably uh, has to. Um, but thank you so much to the chief and the department. I've thought a lot about this and how important it is to know that we can rely on the fire department uh, to call whenever we need anything and that you have to be staffed uh, to serve the town accordingly. Um, I've been reading a lot since our meeting last week about the national shortages we have in healthcare and emergency services after learning that we have nine vacancies right now in the fire department. Um, and on top of that, due to injuries, uh, deployment, and then most recently COVID, there's been an, incre an increasing use of overtime required to staff our three fire stations. And that just really, I think, plays into some of the stories behind this budget. Um, so if we start, it's in your books on page 22, for those of you who have paper. Um, starting out with salaries, um, you will see uh, a total of a 14% increase in the fire department salaries. And the chief, I forwarded you his excellent memo with an overview of, um, of an explanation for that. And I, <clears throat> I can walk through it, but I really think actually Chief Murphy would probably do a better job than I will. I don't know if, um, as far as the salaries go, would you rather just run through this, Chief? It's up to you, Tina. I'm happy to do either one. Um, you know, it, it, as you can see, and as Tina just mentioned, our budget is a complicated budget. Um, for those of you that have been on advisory and have, you know, seen what we're dealing with in the last two years um, have been uh, particularly challenging uh, because, you know, what we used to use for comparables or for even things like estimating our fuel usage and everything, that's all changed um, with COVID and we still don't have normal numbers or anything else. So that is kind of reflected. Um, but however you want to proceed, Tina, I'm happy to explain it or if you want to kind of recap it, it doesn't matter to me. Well, sure. I'll give it a try. And then when we get into the questions, um, you can get into the specifics. Mm -hmm. Um, so the fire department was working without a contract. Um, their collective bargaining agreement expired in June of 2020. Uh, so the salary numbers um, 
were based on fiscal year 2020. But the town was able to negotiate and sign new contracts with the union. Um, they had the, the one year contract in 21 with a 2% COLA. And then most recently, a three year contract, uh, fiscal year 22 through 24, um, that include a 3% COLA for each of the three years plus equity adjustments because we had not reviewed um, we had not reviewed our salary since 2014 and our firefighters were um, well below other communities, which um, does not help in the recruitment process when we are you know dealing with such a national shortage. Um, so if you look in, um, in his review, summarizing the increase with these um, COLA adjustments plus equity, there's approximately 16 and a half percent change in the salary numbers. Um, additionally, there is an increase in the overtime hours, as well as given the salary increases uh, in the overtime rate. Um, the overtime hours are sort of easy to explain when you consider how the staff right now is so short um, that in order to uh, staff all the fire stations, they had to look really hard uh, at how much overtime they were going to require. The training figure, uh, which I thought you know looked like a, a jump, is actually a calculation. And that, hang on one second. Um, that's just an automatic calculation. And there's a difference between paramedics and EMTs. Both uh, require 36 hours of continuing ed and 30 hours for paramedics and 20 hours for EMTs. Last year with EMT retirements, um, we, they were replaced by paramedics. Um, so that's sort of a very high level view of why those figures uh, are so much higher than um, why the jump looks so significant. So are there questions, specific questions on salaries for the chief? I have one, Tina. Great. Um, so just to understand the overtime, if we were fully staffed, would that reduce the overtime or is it still more so a, a kind of a buffer related to what's going on with COVID for next year? Yep. Um, so the way that we operate is we have um, a minimum number of firefighters that work every single day. And then we also have a maximum number. So right now, our staffing allows us to have 13 is the maximum number, um, but to provide normal services and to staff the three fire stations and provide the two ambulances, two fire engines, et cetera, then that requires us to have a minimum of 11 people on duty every single day. So that range between the minimum at 11 versus the maximum at 13 that's basically how many people can be out for any reason at all before we have to hire someone on overtime. So if I have two people that are out because of COVID and then someone takes a vacation day, then we're filling that shift with someone on overtime. Likewise, if we don't have those positions staffed, um, so right now we have um, nine vacancies. Um, I am happy to report on a side note that we actually are interviewing right now and have five candidates two of them are already working for other fire departments and are trained, so they could potentially start very quickly and affect um, our operation. But anyways, to get back to it, with the nine vacancies, that means that every single day, um, every time we have someone out, whether it's on a OJI injury, someone on COVID, someone out on vacation, someone on sick time, whatever the case, someone on training, then we're hiring someone in overtime. Um, and that is absolutely killing our budget because of it. The only good news that comes with that is that 
because we have those nine vacancies, then we also have their salaries that we're not using. Um, but obviously paying someone time and a half is a lot more expensive than paying someone regular time. So it's we're quickly eating through um, even that salary money and everything else. Um, but the overtime for next year that Tina was referring to is we usually, we have a calculator that basically calculates um, all of the salaries for the entire department. And then we usually request the same amount of overtime hours per year. Um, and we have not changed that overtime hours um, for about three or four years. This year I did, did, did increase it a little bit. So I think we added, and I have it detailed in a memo, I'm just looking at it. I think I asked for an additional um, Nine nine thousand nine hundred thirty-seven hours to ten thousand five hundred hours, so roughly five thousand or five hundred and um, seventy hours additional overtime this year versus previous, and that's just to help us offset some of the um, the, the OJIs and everything else that we're having. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. So it seems like just generally, if we're able to fill those vacancies. Um, you could potentially not have to spend all of that in overtime, but this is a, a good a conservative approach to make sure that we're well funded for next year. Okay, thank you so much. Yep, and that's Appreciate to everything fill the vacancies is that's something that we've been working on for forever, yeah. basically. Yeah. And you know, that's where it becomes very difficult. I've worked with many members of the advisory, other members of you know the town, um, volunteers in the town, whatever the case, we've worked with them beforehand to try to figure out what the exact number is. Mm -hmm. um, what I, what we have figured out is that looking at comparative departments that are about the same size as us, um, then we believe that the correct number is probably a little higher than we are. So we think we should be carrying three extra people per shift um, mm -hmm. to be able to have the, the proper buffer and allow people on you know, scheduled vacations, injury time, sick time, whatever, before we're dipping into that. Um, so obviously you're trading one thing off for another. If we're increasing the number of salary uh, personnel, then we're increasing the salary line items, but theoretically we'd be reducing the overtime. It's just it's, yeah. it's a fine mix on where those two numbers cross. Yeah, totally makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Bob, it looks like you have a question. Um, I actually, it's a follow up to what Caitlin and the chief just said that um, as it is my memory that going back to the 2008, 2009 period, the fire department took cuts and that it has been the position of the fire department and both Chief Olson and Chief Murphy that we should be staffing at 14 rather than 13 and that uh, this has been in some ways a perennial issue. And it seems like the question comes up every year uh, between positions and overtime. And uh, it, it may be the wiser course to actually staff at the higher number than, and especially if we're gonna have unfilled positions, than to incur the overtime. And I, I, I welcome the chief's comments on that. Um, Bob, you have a good history and good memory on this. You're correct. Um, we've actually, I just actually prepared a salary comparison type of thing for um, Michelle and Tom. And looking back at it, um, our department actually was at 16 per shift, uh, but that was before Prop two and a half and everything else. And then we, you know, subsequently dropped down and then it's basically a roller coaster, you know, since 1989. Uh, but most recently, our peak, you're correct, from 2004, 2005 to 2009, we were staffed with 14. Um, and that was when Chief Johnson was here and we expanded and added the second ambulance, uh, kind of redeployed the apparatus from headquarters to the outside stations. Um, all of that stuff happened. Um, and then we lost that, unfortunately, with the recession in 2008, 2009. So we did drop down to the point from 14 maximum down to 12 for our maximum, and we were still maintaining the 11. 
Um, and then Chief Duff and Chief Olson worked to get us back up um, to that, you know, that number. And there was actually a middle step in there. Um, we actually were running at 12.75. Um, so three of the groups had 13 assigned and one of the groups still had 12 assigned for a few years. And then I was looking at it, I believe it was in 2018, 2019, that the town supported adding one additional firefighter to bring us to the 13. Uh, but you're correct, we were higher than that back in the you know mid 2000s. Okay. Um, George, do you have something to ask? Uh, yeah, Tina, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Chief. Uh, I just uh, wanted to follow up a little bit on, on Bob's question. Um, Chief, are there any, um, any national standards that would um, guide us in the number of, uh, of uh, firefighters who should be on each shift? Yes and no. So yes, there are national standards, um, but they usually refer more to how many people are assigned to each engine. Um, and so, for example, the national um, accepted number um, is actually four people assigned to actually the ideal number is six people assigned to each fire engine. Uh, four is considered um, a very good um, opportunity, very, you know, favorable to have four. Um, and then there are studies that show that if you only have three people, then it can, you know, affect how much work that crew can do or anything else. Um, sadly, we have two assigned to each engine. So we're half of what the, you know, not the ideal, the ideal would be six, but no one really does that. Uh, most larger cities will operate at four. Um, so Boston, uh, Weymouth, they operate at four. Uh, we only have two per engine. Uh, and that goes back to when Chief Johnson restructured it, um, that he redeployed it, and he kind of used the argument that the two people on the engine would function, or I'm sorry, in the ambulance would function as part of the engine crew. Um, and that's great if they're in quarters, but if they're at the hospital or they're doing another call, then we have a two-person engine crew, um, which is not ideal. Uh, regarding minimum numbers and what, you know, how many per shift or anything, no, there are no national standards on how to do that. Uh, I've actually done a lot of research and we haven't found any model that allows you to really plug in and say, okay, this is what your minimum is, this is what your maximum is. Um, I can't find it and I've seen a lot of people that ask the same questions, but we haven't really found anything. It, it, there's so many variables that factor into it. You know, a long-term OJI can have devastating effects. Um, multiple people out on OJIs, um, National Guard deployments, whatever the case, they all impact it. So. Okay, and just uh, just to follow up on that, so would the location of the fire department, for example, a large city like Boston, uh, compared to a suburban location like Hingham, would that affect the number of um, of firefighters per uh, per truck? Absolutely, you know, um, and. It, it ultimately, it really, you look at it and you base it on what their national numbers are and their, you know, what type of incidents they're dealing with or anything else. So yes, I, that's, that's why a larger city would have that staffing. Um, it would be great um, for every fire department in the country to be able to offer that. Um, but ultimately it comes down to a, you know, risk versus reward benefit analysis right. and, you know, kind of looking at it and saying, okay, how many fires do we do per year? What, you know, what are we doing? What are we looking at? And ultimately that's the decision that every community makes. Um, okay. So, you know, we have two per engine. Many of our neighboring communities only have one per engine, or in some cases they might have multiple engines. Some might have two, some might have one. Um, so it, it really varies across the board as to what that is. It's the NFPA that actually puts those recommendations out there based on their studies and statistics. Okay, so it would not, it would not be fair then to say that we have we only have half of the of the standard uh, and and half of what Boston would have it, because we're it's not an apples and apples type comparison. Correct. It's it's so. very difficult. They their fire problem is similar but different. You know. Yeah. So yeah, it is correct. But um, again, typically that's what you see as you get into the larger you know cities. The anything else, then you're going to see a more robust fire department. Um, obviously, no one can compare to New York. And if you just saw that fire that they just had in the Bronx um, two weeks ago or whatever it was, 
Um, that was an incredible effort that they did that they're probably one of about three fire departments in the world that could have put that effort together. Um, even Boston would have had a lot more problems than what they did. Mm -hmm. New York is a unique situation there. You know, like I said, they're one of the largest departments in the world. So. All, right. All right. Well, thank you, Chief. Sarah? Sarah. Sarah, you have a question. Thank you. Yeah, I did. Um, it's not really a question, actually, just a comment. Um, when we um, met the other day, Chief, you, you made a comment um, that I think the group might appreciate hearing about um, the ability to recoup some money from FEMA um, for the overtime during COVID, um, and that you've taken the initiative to apply for some of that. I think maybe, um, that, that was really helpful to, to know for me, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yep. Um, sorry, I apologize if you can hear my daughter in the background. She's getting ready for a dance class. But um, yes, we. Um, so one of the things that FEMA has is a uh, the ability for communities to recoup um, funding or um, certain expenses after disaster declarations. Um, so typically, this involves when we have a significant storm. Um, the last time that the town of Hingham was eligible for something was back in March storms of 2018. Uh, and the, it's a lengthy application process, but under the dis presidential disaster declaration and what's called the Stafford Act, then different communities can um, request reimbursement on certain items. The good news is that um, the, back in 2020, the president declared COVID basically a disaster for every community in the United States. So any community that um, is interested can apply for certain reimbursements from that. This is separate from the CARES Act, it's separate from ARPA uh, or anything else. And they, the fortunate thing is that one of the expenses that they are allowing is overtime to continue providing staffing um, for public safety. Um, that's a, it's a very limited on what they'll do, but for police staffing and for um, fire department staffing, we've been eligible to apply for those. So working with the police department, um, we so far have submitted um, grants or not grants, reimbursements ranging back from January of 2020 up through this current, uh, the start of this fiscal year. So we're through June. I'm working on additional applications because FEMA has extended the application period and we're eligible to continue applying up through right now, April of 2022. Um, so to this date, we have um, submitted um, over, I think about 1.5 million um, in FEMA reimbursements and the town has received about 250,000. Uh, now, it seems like it should be kind of a different number on that, but honestly, the early applications we did, we lumped multiple, multiple months together and didn't realize that it was a different review process for FEMA. So they are working through, we have one application that's almost 900,000 that's in the queue. Um, and there's another one for about 550, 560,000 that's also in the queue. They just take a lot longer to process through. All indications are that we will be reimbursed for that, but the other applications that we've done, we've kept under the uh, kind of a limit in FEMA, which is considered a large cap versus a small cap project. And those have been processed through. So um, the, all of the individual months we started doing month by month, we've received the money on everything except for one month, which the town recently got the contract, uh, meaning that the, the money will probably be uh, paid within about an next week to two weeks. Um, so we're doing well on that. I have to actually get going on doing the ones for this fiscal year um, with the hope that we can get it back in time during this fiscal year. Because uh, Sue has expressed that that money would actually be returned to the department and then offset our overtime accounts and everything else. Um, so I can tell you that, you know, doing um, one month for the month of July um, it was 150,000 just for the fire department alone on our overtime. Um, so unfortunately that pushes me above the cap, which makes it a large project. Um, so it will take longer. I'm hoping the other months are less than that, but I haven't gone through yet, that yet. But yes, we are working and um, hopefully can get the money before the end of the fiscal year. That's so great. 
Bob, do you have another question? I, I, I do actually, uh, and it relates to global warming and fire. And uh, the town of Hingham obviously owns an awful lot of open space. And in our town, we have uh, an awful lot of open space owned by the state and or the trustees. And we have seen the, the fire devastation in the West attributed to global warming. And I wanted to ask if you felt that there was adequate planning to prevent fires attributable to global warming or other sources in our open space, and whether this budget provides you with the personnel and resources that you would need in the event that we had that kind of fire emergency? That's a great question. It's a scary question, though, because you are absolutely correct. The wildland issues that many parts of this country are dealing with are a totally, totally different problem. You know, um, yes, we've had fires in, you know, the, um, you know, George Washington forest, we've had fires in uh, Wapatak State Park or anything else, but they're usually limited to a few acres. Um, and some of the fires that you see in the news are, you know, just absolutely massive. And I have many friends that I've met through the National Fire Academy that deal with these problems on a regular basis. And, you know, you, you like I have a friend of mine that works for Dallas Fire Department. Every summer, he usually gets deployed to California, you know. Um, so that tells you the extent of what they're dealing with and um, how, you know, massive some of these issues are. Uh, to answer your question, are we prepared? Um, we're prepared for a, a um, what we've experienced beforehand. If the entire Wampatuck State Park went up, then we would rely on mutual aid partners um, through both the state, the county, and milk, uh, mutual or other communities here. But truthfully, the state of Massachusetts is not prepared for uh, that type of a fire uh, like what they deal with in other parts of the country. Uh, the National Fire Academy and you know Department of um, the National Fire Service, everything else is doing a lot of education on it, um, but it's a totally different situation, you know. Um, so I don't know that, um, I, fortunately, I don't know that we have the need for it yet, but we are working on it. We are keeping in the back of the mind as is just about every community that has a large park or anything else. Uh, but again, you're talking about areas that are, you know, thousands and thousands of acres, you know, that are going up and it's just a totally different situation. But. Wow. Um, Andy. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob, were you finished? Did you have something else? No, I, I mean, oops. Uh, am, I, am I off mute? Yes, Did you, hear you me? are. Yeah, I, you know, I, I wanted to raise the question, but, you know, I understand it could be a, a, a conversation for an entire meeting. So yep. I, I'll, I'm happy to leave it there. Happy to know that it's on the radar. Yeah, it, it, like I said, it's, and I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not a wildland firefighter. I've never had any training on it or anything else. Um, I have had a lot of conversations with people that do that, and I'm in awe of what they do. It's a totally different type of thing than structural firefighting. That's what our training is. That's what most of our equipment is. When we, we do have a brush truck and we have some equipment, but like I said, it's to deal with a one acre, two acre fire or anything else, not something like what they're dealing with where you have thousands and thousands of pieces of fire apparatus, personnel, everything else trying to attack that fire that goes on for days and days, totally different thing. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I do think it, you're right though, it's something that we need to consider and we need to make sure that if it does eventually happen, then we are prepared for it. Okay. Uh, Andy, do you have a question on salaries? Um, it's more general than that. It perhaps ties into salaries somewhat obliquely, but uh, if I may. Uh, Chief, is there any uh, movement towards uh, uh, municipalities requiring sprinklers in residential structures, single family residential structures? 
th that's actually a great question as well. You guys are both doing a lot of national research <laughs> on fire issues. Um, that is something that um, has been addressed both at a national level and at a state level. Um, and there are uh, a lot of people in the fire service in particular that are advocating for that. Um, it's been something that the Fire Chiefs Association of Mass and um, probably the professional firefighters of Massachusetts, our legislative type of you know, bodies that we have have been advocating for that for a while. Unfortunately, they're also meeting a lot of resistance from the construction agent or industry or anything else regarding this because it's you know costs additional costs to the homeowner to the developer and all that. Um, I believe there is a bill that is um, still in the state legislature net right now. Um, some states have actually made it a ballot option, um, and then and unfortunately, like I think Michigan, it got voted down. Um, Massachusetts is working through that. Um, I believe what, you know, we're hearing, I actually have a meeting tomorrow that I might get more information. I can follow back up with you. But I think the best case scenario in Massachusetts would be that that would be passed as a local option. So the, can, the town could adopt that bylaw or choose not to adopt a bylaw. I do not think from what we're hearing that the state will come out and mandate this. I think it's going to be available if communities choose to do it. Um, personally, I would be very much in favor of it, but I understand that there's obviously another side of the issue. Um, and I'm sure that there's, you know, just as many people that may have questions or concerns about it, um, but it, they, they have been proven uh, to save lives. And, and that's, you know, one of the things that we as firefighters always strive for. That's the main goal of the fire service itself is to um, save lives and reduce property damage. So. I, I think I think my other question I'll hold and uh, when we get into the chief's presentation uh, on the, the chart on fire department call volume, it's so all passed for now. Thank okay. you, chief. Thank you, Andy. Um, all right, I'll move on now to expenses, but um, we can go back and ask questions. Uh, uh, be, be, Tina, well, before you do what. What's the differential, uh, the salary? The salaries is uh, a total of 14, it's 14% 14 in total in the budget. 14% uh, increase? Mm -hmm. And what, what's that, 810,165, is that? I don't have the actual figure. Okay, okay. No, never mind. That's, that's correct. correct. That's uh, correct, uh, Andy. That's the okay. amount. Okay. And I, I have, if that's correct, then I, I would have it higher than 14%, but I'll do the math again and check my numbers. Okay. Sorry. Maybe, maybe mine are wrong. Um, so if we move on to the expenses, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that 91% um, of the fire department budget is salaries. Um, so I have a total increase in the fire budget of 11 and a half. I'm, and I did my math and um, by hand, I hope I didn't do it wrong. Um, but in any event, so another area of the fire department is being uh, affected by COVID is um, in their expenses and particularly the cost and delay and getting things done uh, in the vehicles line. Um, as the vehicles have become more complex, I remember when I worked on the um, central fire station, one of the things the firefighters were so proud of is how much work they did on the trucks and how much they were able to do in house. And now, um, given how complex and computerized these vehicles are, they really have to outsource so much of the of the work that they have to do. And, you know, there's a an increase in the um, in the vehicle budget line from that. Um, one of the things they talked about is they wait multiple months for necessary parts to come in. Um, upwards, I think it was six months and working with um, capital to replace a fire truck. The best case timing for the replacement of that truck is 12 to 18 months, which I thought was just amazing uh, given where we are today. Uh, buildings only make up 
1% of the budget, but there is um, an increase in the cost of repair and maintenance. We all took the tour of the buildings and were aware of the stations and how challenging it is to maintain them. Even the newer central fire station is aging and has significant maintenance work to be done. Um, the contract charge the contractors who come out to do the work when they can get them are charging sometimes almost double. And the heating and oil figures, those are done on the standard town spreadsheet, but the costs have gone up significantly. Uh, the fuel figures are higher. And one of the reasons for that is that um, fiscal year 21 was a down year given COVID and the lockdown with fewer people being out, fewer people on the roads, um, their call volume was down. So the fuel was figured this year on this year's um, call volume and then it was extrapolated from that. Uh, the cost of metal equipment has skyrocketed. PPE as an example. Um, one example the chief gave us was that the price of gloves has actually doubled. And in today's environment, um, they're using a lot more of those gloves. Um, and is that, are those sort of the highlights of the, sorry, my eyes are so bad. Those are sort of the highlights of the differences in the expense budget. Um, but I can leave that also um, to the chief to discuss things that I might have missed. Yep, you, thank you, Tina. You did a great job on summarizing it. Um, one other example of the delays that we're dealing with is we ordered a new ambulance in March of 2021. Um, previous to this, the last time that we bought a new ambulance, the lead time on it was about four to six months. Uh, we have uh, not received a delivery date yet. We're being told that it could be sometime in February, but it could be even longer than that. Um, and surprisingly, we just actually heard that the markup value for used ambulances is, is skyrocketed because that same 12 to 18 months is happening for ambulance as well. Um, so other communities that were looking to order one because they needed one right away or anything else are um, looking towards purchasing used ambulances just because they can't get one. Um, and it's the same thing with the fire engine that we are requesting now. That's what, um, as Tina mentioned, we're hearing that that's a minimum of 12 to 18 months, whereas normally on a, a typical engine, it might be six to nine months. Um, so everything is taking longer. Um, we had some parts that our mechanic has had to wait for over three months for the parts. And in some cases, that means that the vehicle is out of service. Um, so it's putting more mileage on the vehicles that should be reserve trucks or anything else, um, just because, you know, it. So in some cases, it's the vehicle can be used, but it's only basically in an emergency. We don't want to continue using it if it's not 100% up. All right, does anyone have any more questions for the chief um, in this expenses area? Andy, are you gonna hold your question? I'm sorry, I, yes, I will. Uh, 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 what, since you called my name, I'll just take advantage of that. Sorry, chief, but okay. uh, with, with three, uh, are there any, uh, is there any profit in, in seeking to do some regionalization with regard to at least backup vehicles? So the department used to be involved in a regional ambulance. Um, I met a number of years ago. Um, and if I remember correctly, I think originally it was about five different towns um, that were, per, you know, involved in that. And they would um, you know, share the expenses on maintenance and share the, you know, upkeep on it, whatever the case. And then if they needed it, they could. Um, that was a little bit prior to my time. I remember when it existed, I think when I started here, we were still, you know, kind of involved in that. And then the town got out of it because it just came to the point when we needed the vehicle, it wasn't available. And 
that's one of the things like, you know, as Tina mentioned that the long time on maintenance and some of the issues that we have, unfortunately, these trucks, whether it's a fire engine or an ambulance is not like someone's car. And, you know, typically if you take your car to the auto, um, you know, auto dealer, garage, whatever, and you have a brake job done on it or anything, then you're going to get that back in, you know, maybe that day, uh, the longest, maybe a day or two, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it would be rare for you to have to go and go um, a week or two without a vehicle in the fire service on having our re vehicles replaced. That is like to get a vehicle back in a week would be awesome. Um, it just doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, we have, the town has four ambulances total. We have two in service at all times. Uh, we had to borrow an ambulance for a very short time last year because we had three ambulances being worked on at the same time. Um, and that's just because, again, the delays in parts, delays in getting them worked on or anything else. So I think it's a great idea to be involved in one of those regional things, but the town got out of it because it just wasn't beneficial for us. And, you know, I, no, I, money I and not being able to use the vehicle or anything else when you get, especially then there was five communities in it. I believe there are still two of them that are involved in that type of thing. Uh, but you don't really see that reserve truck anymore. So. Okay, that I guess uh, I can understand how regionaliz regionalization of currently used vehicles would be difficult. But with the, what I was just thinking, with the long delay time in repairs and acquisitions, uh, whether a regionalization of reserve vehicles would be a good idea. And that's, that's what I was thinking about. And, and clearly you've already thought about that. So uh, I'll pass and say thank you. Great, um, Dave Elaine. Oh, I just wanted to say I think I think we're probably about ready to get to the slides that Chief's prepared, but this isn't information isn't in them, and so I think it's important if we haven't uh, if we don't realize it, the ambulance generates a lot of money for the town uh, because those those services in transporting people to the hospital are are reimbursed or are paid for or they're charged, and I think the chief gave us a number of. Uh, somewhere between 1.4 and 1.5 million dollars uh, comes to the town through ambulance fees. Now that doesn't go to the fire department, that goes to the general fund. So I just think it's important because we look at this, it's a big budget, but it's also a budget that generates some money, some revenue for the town. Agreed, and I think it's really important for the new people on ADCOM to, to understand that. And I was hoping that Chief would touch on that in his presentation. Um, uh, can, I, can I follow up on that and just ask one simple question? I have heard this and I don't know if it's true. Is it true that you only get reimbursed um, if in fact the, uh, the ambulance transports somebody to a hospital? Yes, that is correct. So um, just answering a call, that. you don't get reimbursed for that. No, um, it's because of the uh, Medicare, um, the CMS rules and regulations. Uh, there's a lot of change to try to, you know, change that. Uh, but not only is it, you know, must transport, but we're not allowed currently to transport to like an urgent care facility or anything else. We have to go to a, a licensed um, hospital with an emergency room. Um, so if our staff goes out and, uh, say, for example, linen ponds, if they help someone that was on the floor and needed to get help back into bed, um, we don't charge for that. Um, and we um, don't have the ability to charge for it. Same thing if we went out and actually treated a patient uh, and then they refused to go to the hospital, we don't bill for those services either. It's not allowed under Medicare. So I hope you train your, your people in upsell technique. <laughs> Okay, David, and I'm happy to have the chief move on to his presentation now. If no one has anything right now to add, to ask. Okay, so um, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, and I do have, uh, I saw Deputy Lachance was um, joined. He had joined the, the um, select board meeting earlier and it looks like he had joined us with this. Um, but so as I kind of said to the um, select board that this slide here, uh, for the most part, really hasn't changed. Um, 
this is probably something that we can continue using the same slide for years after year after year. Um, our mission doesn't really change. Uh, some of the complexities of delivering that mission and some of the operational considerations are what changes. Um, and as um, Bob was alluding to earlier, you know, the, some of our problems change. So wildland is becoming an issue that, you know, never was beforehand. Um, still going to remain the same. That's what we're trying to do on public education, risk reduction, whatever the case. But, you know, our primary mission is the same. It always will be. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? Um, Deputy Yuan, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so as you can see, our call volume over time has pretty much increased every year. Uh, 2020 was kind of an off year. Uh, typically, less people on the roads, less people going to work, so less transports to the hospital. Um, so our numbers were low in uh, 2020. Um, but 2021, they went right up again. Um, the data on the screen does not include uh, December. So 2021 was actually our busiest year to date. Um, 4,993 uh, calls for service. Um, and over 3,200 of those calls were for medical calls or uh, for car accidents. So uh, 2021, definitely our busiest year up to date. Uh, next slide. Can, uh, can I interrupt for a minute? Yes. Going back to that last slide. Uh, so, uh, if to, to get to the total number of non EMS calls, uh, I'd take uh, deduct the number from the black line, uh, black bar from, from the red bar, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, the 2021 is, is short a month, but yeah, the total, the total calls is everything. Um, where EMS is in, in, in the black. Um, All right. and, and the green the green is included in the black, right? Correct. So out of okay. those EMS calls, the green would have been the people trans actually transported to an emergency room. Okay. And 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 the balance be the non EMS calls. How how many of those were were working fires in any given year? So the way the way the data goes with our fire reporting system, so we have to report to the state and to the national uh, at the national level. Um, so the fire series in total, we had a, a 68 in that fire series. So not all of them were, you know, complete structure fires, building fires, um, but they fall within that 68 um, for fires. But then there's other hazardous conditions, calls for service, um, good intent calls, fire alarms, and, and, and such. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and just kind of a graph that goes over the ambulance transports um, by month. Obviously, December is not accurate, um, missing that month. But in 2021, like I said, we did over 3,200 um, EMS calls. And uh, just over 20, 2,200 of those were actually transports to the emergency room. So 2020 was kind of the fluke in there. Uh, I think, Chief, okay. I think the next slide's yours. Yeah, yeah next slide, okay. Um, so some of the things that um, we're working on is obviously we already discussed um, the filling our vacancies. Um, and I think Tina mentioned it, that she had done some research and, you know, kind of confirmed what we had mentioned. This is a nationwide problem. Um, currently in Massachusetts, the governor has enacted the National Guard to assist with hospital staffing and what's not uh, necessarily just talked about that much, but it is a major part of it, is to actually staff private ambulance companies because they can't have, um, we heard about a month ago, and we'll probably hear more on our meeting tomorrow, but most ambulance companies are down in their staffing about 40%. Uh, so they cannot uh, fulfill their contracts with nursing homes. They can't take patients to the dialysis. Um, they can't do the hospital discharges without hour long waits. Um, so that's a problem to the extent that it got the National Guard in activated. Um, so we're working on it. Um, one of the things that I'm very happy about is that last contract that the town just signed has incentives to try to encourage people that already have training to come to our fire department. Because normally 
we would take them and send them, we hire them as a paramedic, then we send them to uh, firefighter school and they learn how to become a firefighter. Well, if we can get someone that already has that training and experience, then we can punch them in right away. And like I mentioned, we're, you know, we don't know how it's going to go. We haven't actually gone through it, but we have two candidates that are currently working at other fire departments that are expressed interest in coming to work to the town of Hingham. That's fantastic. That's like a best case scenario for us. We can kind of steal someone that already had the training someplace else, and then they can um, impact our staffing levels, everything else right off the bat. Um, some other big priorities that we're obviously working on, uh, the public safety building. Uh, that, you know, is definitely something that I know um, police and fire are uh, very interested in it. We've been working with the subgroups. Um, we've been also working with members of the building committee, and we're very happy with the way that they progress or the project is progressing. Um, some other individual things is that um, within the last year, we had a new deputy chief um, that was promoted, um, and he's been doing a great job of uh, additional fire training, um, Case in point, we actually um, recently went to the Boston Fire burn building uh, to use their burn building because burn buildings are actually very difficult to get into. Uh, there's only a few of them around. And this was the first time in probably about 15 years that we got there, we were able to go there for six different days. Um, and it was because of the work that Deputy Levinson kind of instituted getting our staff out there and it was great training for them. Um, so those are some of the other things a, you know, we're working on creating a pre-inspection program, which is something that um, our staff would go and uh, do a walkthrough on all commercial properties and they identify any hazards, they identify other key factors for our staff, such as the location of alarm panels, sprinkler connections, whatever the case. Uh, emergency management, uh, we still have, we, we thought we were kind of getting out of the COVID phase a little bit and some of the other support meetings that we've had, and then we got pulled right back in. So we're now doing vaccination clinics again uh, for the residents and employees of the town. And we have been working with other town departments, uh, including police and town administration to support the town's response to COVID. Uh, and then finally, just, you know, continuing to work on other things within our department, such as updating some older SOPs and policy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, we are budgeted for 57 full-time positions. Obviously the chief, uh, there are two deputies that was created a couple of years ago, kind of split the duties, uh, one for administration and one for training and operations. Um, one office manager, we have one fire prevention officer who works a, uh, a weekday normal schedule out doing fire prevention and inspections, code enforcement. Um, we do run the four shifts. So each shift has a captain. Uh, he's responsible for the, the operations of that 24 hour shift. Um, 12 lieutenants. So each fire station has one lieutenant on duty. Uh, he or she is responsible for that crew. And then uh, 36 firefighter EMTs or paramedics. Um, I think it was covered earlier. We're currently nine, have nine vacant positions, uh, which we're trying to fill. Um, like the chief said, um, we're working on that now with hopefully two lateral transfers. Um, we did make one job offer today, hopefully another one tomorrow. Um, so we might be able to fill a couple of those nine vacancies. Um, so the salaries, and I know the chief touched on it earlier with the new contract being signed, salaries uh, will be at $6,554,825 and expenses. And I know, I think Tina touched on the major items as far as fuel, repair and maintenance of the buildings and the vehicles. Um, the vehicles are more complicated. And what we actually found is less and less of our vendors from the past can actually work on these vehicles now. Uh, they're so complex and some proprietary computer systems to read um, diagnostics and such like that, um, which is, is taking more time and costing more money. Uh, next slide. So the other two things that uh, we've requested is um, to one of the things that we're considering on our staffing issue uh, is that, as I mentioned, we historically going back uh, about 20 years now have consistently hired paramedics. Uh, it's great. They already have the paramedic training and then we send them to train as a firefighter afterwards. 
some other departments um, will actually hire EMTs rather than paramedics and then send them to training afterwards. We don't necessarily love the idea of doing it, but because we need to fill these positions, we're exploring every option that's out there for us. And we know with the national shortage on paramedics and because we have civil service restrictions, it becomes very difficult to hire paramedics. Uh, case in point, um, the last time the new list came out for civil service, there were over 4,000 candidates that took the exam and 237 of them, I believe, were for paramedics. That was it um, out of 4,000. Uh, so, and we know looking at those that there were many candidates that we recognized already worked on fire departments or there were candidates that had basically been known to be non-hireable candidates or less than desirable candidates and had been you know, kind of bypassed by many, many different communities. So we're hoping that things get better because civil service is now offering exa entrance level exams every year rather than every two years. Uh, and there should be a new results coming out in March. So we're hoping between that uh, working with paramedic schools to train their students and, and we allow them to do paramedic time at Hingham Fire Department and possibly sending them to school. We're hoping that, you know, all of these approaches kind of help us um, fulfill some of the staffing issues that we're having. Um, so that's the first request. And that would be to cover the expense of sending someone to tu the tuition for sending someone to paramedic school for two individuals. And it would allow us to cover their release time. So if they were scheduled to be on duty and had to attend paramedic school, then we would have to pay someone or most likely we would have to pay someone overtime to cover them. Uh, so that would be the second portion of that request. Uh, and the final request that we're um, asking for is additional four firefighters. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier with Bob regarding to get us to that 14 cap instead of that 13 um, to allow us to have a three person um, you know, shift differential, if you want to call it, before we have to hire. So, um, and I believe that was our last slide. All right. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? I know we are using a lot of our time. Sorry. No, it's so interesting and complicated. Anybody else? Okay, then shall I just do a recommendation on this budget, David Lee? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that, Tina? Thanks, George. Um, I can't see a thing. All right, for uh, fiscal year 2023 for the fire department salaries, I recommend 6,554,825. For fire department expenses, 616,943. That's a total uh, 2023 request of 7,171,768. All right, thank you very much, Tina. Uh, thank you, Chief Murphy. Tina, your 14% increase in the salaries was correct. I checked my math, you were right. Thank you, Andy. Um, can I just ask the quickest question? Did the fire department and the police department go to the high school and do presentations to the high schoolers about job opportunities and civil service exams and things like that? We had, um, we have done that before. Um, we haven't done it recently. We were actually talking about doing that before COVID. And then we actually did do, um, I think I was in it. I never saw it myself, but I, they, um, I got filmed for a, um, job opportunity type of video um, as you know I pre to present to some of the students um, but that was a year ago uh, that we did that so we'd, we'd love to go there and do any presentations um, we just haven't actually um, been able to do it yet so. thank you thank you everyone thanks thanks chief right. thank you um I can't so oh, hand when I'm presenting, but uh, I just okay. want to add to that, Tina, just as a point, this is totally anecdotal, um, but a, a friend of um, one of my kids this year wanted to sit for the civil service, couldn't get a spot, and so joined the National Guard instead. So even if they go and promote it, I, we don't have the capacity in the state to, hire, to, to go through the training. 
which is awful. There's there's also an age limit on it too. You have to be 19 to actually sit for the exam. And so, I believe he is, yeah. 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 We actually, believe it or not, we have had a number of candidates that have come to us when they were in high school that have expressed interest in coming to the fire department. Um, I am happy that one of them we actually have working for us as a firefighter paramedic, uh, Ben Yadzio. Um, he came to us a number of years ago um, and you know we kind of pushed him in the right direction and everything. But yeah, it's because of the civil services requirement that you have to be 19, then it's you know something that they unfortunately can't do while they're in school. All right, thank you uh, for the fire department budget presentation. And um, next we're going to move on to the police department. So that's Nancy McDonald uh, is the lead on the police department budget. So, and uh, I know that Chief Jones is here. I'm not sure Chief, if any of anyone else is here with you. Uh, yeah, I do have uh, Deputy Chief Brian O'Shea with me and uh, Lieutenant David Petiti as well. Ah, welcome. Well, okay. And then for the animal control will be on next, but uh, animal control officer is on as well. Okay, great. Terrific. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, and as always, it was a pleasure <coughs> being with your team to, to um, understand the budgets. Um, we, as uh, we discussed earlier, we were going to to flip it and Chief Jones is going to actually do the presentation first um, as it answers questions and then we will get into the numbers. Great, thanks so much, Nancy. And thank you everyone for having us uh, tonight. Uh, so I'll just run through the uh, slide presentation that we had that we presented at the Board of Selectmen meeting um, the other day. Uh, so just first, uh, the department's core values are integrity, service, excellence and leadership. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide here just gives some of the uh, benchmarks for calls for service uh, from 2012 through present. Um, this actually, I think, is an old uh, slide. The newest slide has our numbers up around uh, 30, over 30,000 uh, calls for service for 2021. Uh, it was updated at the end of the calendar uh, year. So uh, for 21, we do have uh, another increase in calls for service over 2019. Uh, 2020 was down, obviously, due to uh, COVID, much like the fire department. Um, our most frequent calls for service uh, was uh, 911 calls. Uh, we answer all 911 calls, uh, landline and cellular, uh, that come into our regional dispatch center. Um, we have uh, building and area checks next, and that could be anything from a uh, patrol request for a, uh, a business or a religious institution or a school or something like that. Um, motor vehicle stops was uh, third, and then uh, any medical related call that we uh, were dispatched to. Uh, next slide, please. So just briefly, our uh, court statistics for the year. Um, these numbers are, uh, again, not updated, but I think we had 83. Uh, arrests, if I remember correctly, 154. Uh, complaint applications, which are uh, summonsing uh, somebody into court for a uh, criminal offense. And uh, I think we had over 14,000, uh, or 1,400 rather, incident reports for uh, calendar year 21. Um, and that also is obviously not updated. It's 21 uh, stats. Uh, we had uh, 2,951 citations. Um, I think it was 380 something motor vehicle crash with the updated number and a little over 200 parking tickets for the year. And this yeah. um, this is a typo, correct? This should be 21. Yeah, the updated one did, what did have uh, uh, 21 uh, in it. That, that is a typo, correct, at that version. So the police department, uh, we have uh, staffing uh, allotted as 53 uh, full-time sworn personnel, uh, it's a chief of police, one deputy chief of police. Uh, we have five lieutenants, seven sergeants, and then 39 uh, patrol officers. And out of those patrol officers, we have four school resource officers and uh, three uh, detectives. We have a uh, civilian staff of three, uh, soon to be four with our newly approved um, mental health clinician that was approved at last town meeting. Uh, we have two, Police canines, 
we have nine school crossing guards and 25 part-time special police officers. Next slide, please. So some of our key initiatives, uh, which a lot of them mirror uh, last year, um, due to the, the uh, continuation of uh, the COVID pandemic, but we're looking to get um, re-engage with the community, uh, reintroduce, reintroduce our programs, such as the Citizens Police Academy at the station and Linden Ponds, our National Night Out program, our Family Fun Day that we have every year, um, and then things like community meetings with the Boy and Girl Scouts, canine demonstrations, et cetera. And we're looking to partner with new community groups to offer uh, any new programs uh, for our mm -hmm. community. Um, training, we're looking to comply with the new training mandates. Uh, and there's a lot of them due to uh, the police reform legislation that was recently passed. And we're looking to offer innovative and new training opportunities for our current employees and focus on some regional uh, training opportunities uh, that arise. Uh, for outreach programs, we have the uh, Plymouth County Outreach, which is for uh, drug dependency and overdoses. We have a uh, domestic violence advocate. We have a um, mental health commission on a uh, grant that we share with another community. Uh, and then the full-time uh, employee that we're gonna be hiring uh, coming up shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So for uh, salaries and expenses, um, I, I, I don't know if this number is updated because this is definitely the uh, old version of the slide, but um, if it's not updated. Uh, this, is, this, is the, the, this is the number that's in the budget book currently. Okay, perfect. So uh, for fifth fiscal 23 salaries, it's total of uh, 6,320,984. Um, and it's broken down uh, right below it on, uh, on uh, what category each that falls into. Um, for fiscal 23 expenses, that's 486,750. And some of the top line items uh, under expenses, obviously this isn't inclusive of everything, uh, is officer equipment, uh, vehicle fuel, which I'll touch on quickly. We got um, seven hybrid uh, vehicles last year, and uh, we've seen a uh, fairly dramatic uh, savings uh, on those seven vehicles. All seven are frontline uh, patrol vehicles. So when we compared the six month period, we just got them in July, um, the last ones uh, in July of uh, last year. So comparatively to the, to the prior year, um, we saw savings in, in that six month period of uh, 6,245.6 uh, gallons of gas that are saved. So we saw an increase uh, of a little over six miles per gallon uh, per those vehicles. And if you, the average price per fuel, uh, per gallon rather, for uh, 21 was $2.77. So that equates to a, uh, an approximate savings of $17,300 for uh, that six month time period from July to December. And if you average that out for uh, the 12 months of the year, um, it's approximately $34,600 $34, um, savings uh, for the hybrid vehicles. Um, more importantly, there's a, uh, a benefit to, to the environment and uh, we're showing a 55.5 a, a metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide reduction with uh, those seven uh, vehicles. Um, so some of the other um, expenses, the top expenses in our uh, budget request is vehicle repairs are 45,000, uh, continuing education, is, uh, which is our training budget is 35,000 and uh, training supplies is uh, 26,400. Uh, next slide, please. So for additional requests for fiscal uh, 23, uh, these two items are, are uh, go hand in hand um, where we have requesting three full-time police officers for a total of 211,695 uh, that would provide one additional officer on duty during each shift. Uh, remember, we run three shifts, uh, midnight to eight, eight to four, and four to 12. Uh, so that would put one additional officer on each of those shifts. That would help to reduce overtime expenditures and reduce the number of times that officers are being forced uh, to work a double shift. 
Uh, second request is to increase the overtime budget. Uh, the request is for $40,000. Uh, and as you are all well aware, our overtime budget uh, exceeds our budgeted amount in excess of $100,000 annually. Uh, due to those unfunded training mandates, investigations, report, court appearances, special town events, et cetera. Uh, so for um, a little additional information on those uh, three, uh, two additional requests, we have some, uh, some graphics to show you uh, that I think will help shed a little light on why we're requesting uh, this. So this graph here, the main graph shows our calls for service from 1980 through uh, 2021, and you can see the uh, the steady and uh, dramatic increase uh, over those uh, years. The inserted graph is our sworn patrol officer staff. So this does not include school resource officers, but it includes all patrol officers, officers that are assigned to work on the road. Um, and you'll see that there's a reduction uh, in the number of authorized officers uh, in that same period while the call volume is uh, continues to rise. Uh, next graph, please. So this shows calendar year 2021, um, the categories of um, overtime uh, that, that we pay into. So you notice that the top two um, reasons for overtime being spent is training and patrol. So the next slide will show a breakdown of that patrol um, bar graph there. And you'll see that um, the vast majority of that uh, is due to shift overtime. So shift overtime is, is uh, overtime necessary to maintain uh, our minimum staffing levels. Um, that's not anything beyond that. So shift overtime is just to maintain uh, staffing levels. Uh, if you go to the next one. So this, these graphs here shows uh, broken down by shift um, on the bottom. Uh, the, the main graph there. So the first shift is midnight to eight, second is eight to four, and the third is uh, four to 12. So you see the majority of overtime is on our four to 12 shift, but the majority of times that officers are being forced to work a shift. So in other words, um, you know, officers are working the day shift. Um, there's an opening on the next shift on four to 12. That opening is paged out to all employees if nobody takes that or accepts that overtime, someone from the shift that's working is forced to work that next shift. Um, so you can see that on midnights, you know, 74% of the time there's overtime and officers being forced to work that shift. Uh, so that's forced them to work 16 hours um, in a row. Uh, that's, you know, they might be working more than that if they'd, if they'd worked, you know, had court in the day or something like that. So, um, and then if you look at that last uh, bar graph on the right, that's the totals uh, for all three shifts. And even looking at that, you know, if you look at 40% of our shifts are forced overtime shifts that we just can't fill um, when we try to fill it with a, with the staff that's, that's working. And I think that's the last one, right, Nancy? It is, yeah. Okay, uh, so that's the presentation and the requests. All right. Well, thank you, Chief. Um, so I'll just run through the numbers here. Um, so um, the expense expenses are um, six million three hundred twenty thousand nine hundred eighty four. Dollars that was an increase of $275,114 or 4.5%. Um, and as both chiefs have now explained, that was all um, contractual. Um, the expenses are 486,750, which was an increase of 89,250 or 22.6%. Um, the largest categories um, for uh, increasing um, was the, um, the, the fuel expenses and the r and for the, the vehicles. And as the chief just explained, our fuel costs are down um, for repair and maintenance. And good, the good news is the, the annualized 
um, savings and fuels actually makes up it more than compensates for the increase in the repair and maintenance. Um, but the, as the as the uh, cars be, as the vehicles become more complex, the ability to do maintenance internally um, has has been has gone down. Um, the fuel cost, as with all the departments across the board, has gone up. Um, one of the other categories is printing. Um, and some of that was taken um, because of the um, manuals, but the training, but also that now the officers each have their own printers in the cars. Um, and so that that has caused an increase in the printing um, expenses. Uh, and then the service agreements and I forget which but budget we saw last week, but had a similar that the service agreements are um, have had um, five and ten percent increases or kickers, so that that has gone up in the the police department as well. Um, and just as a reminder, the the IT budget covers the um, the the software and the IT expenses of the police department as it relates specifically to what's in the building, um, simply because it's there in town hall. Um, but they also have their own servers and own programs, particularly cloud-based programs that they run that come out of the police department directly. So some of it's covered by our IT budget and some of it is not. And then another increase um, was in the, re the recruiting academy. Um, and, and the chief talked about that bringing in those expenses. Um, so I see hands raised. I'm gonna do it in the, or I don't know who raised their hand first, but I'm gonna do it in the order of, of how I'm seeing it on the screen. So George, did, do you have a question? Uh, Nancy, I just, I'm looking at, um, at my book and for salaries, I'm showing a number of $6.7 million which I think is higher than the number that you've quoted. So one of us has um, a more accurate number. Nancy, I, one of the contracts was settled uh, in the middle of uh, the budget books being put together. So that might explain the discrepancy. Did they not, because I pulled those off. Let me look, I pulled them off today again, let me. I had yeah, the same that, question. That's from the 12 same six, Nancy. I, I'll guarantee that the, the ones George has is correct because the one you have is on the screen is from 12 six. Yeah. So, and that's, just, that's what I, and I apologize. That's what's in the Dropbox folder. Yeah, I think the Dropbox hasn't been updated. Then. So, the drop, so I was. Yeah, the Dropbox the, isn't always updated so <laughs> or something. I, Right. Well, I mean, if the Dropbox wasn't, then nor were the hard copies, I don't think. Uh, I apologize. I don't know how you want to handle this, Julie. Um, I, well, Nan I'm, Nancy, I can tell you. I, I, we did all of our meetings and what I printed off today and I'm showing are based on the 12-6 number. If, if George has the accurate number, we should just, can't we just George, you, see that number? Yeah, Nancy, yeah. I can tell you. So the number is six million seven hundred thousand four hundred thirty-nine dollars, which is an increase of six hundred forty-nine thousand eight hundred ninety-four dollars, or ten point seven percent. Okay. Can you can you send me those um, the, what, the sheets that you have, George? Yeah. And might I ask where you got them? <laughs> <laughs> I got the them from Sue. They're in, correct. They're in the big book. <laughs> oh yeah, so they're in the book. We don't have them, and um, I, I, didn't, I never got the book. So the book, I guess, the people who have the books have the correct numbers, and the people who took it off the website, off the Dropbox, do not have the correct numbers. But we'll get an updated um, file and um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get an updated file and distribute um, to the full committee. 
Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so that uh, I um, I haven't seen the actual numbers yet, George, but am I to believe that the uh, the major difference is in the salaries, not in the expenses? Is that yeah, correct? That, that's correct. Okay. The, the, expense so, number is, the expense, so, expense number did not change. Okay, so then that says to me that um, as long as the chair is comfortable with it, since the salaries are contractual, um, I, I'm, I'm comfortable going ahead with this discussion tonight, but Julie, that's, I leave that to your discretion. Yeah, that's fine. Just um, George read off okay. the correct yep. number yep. uh, for the um, salary. So that's fine. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, George. So next, Al, or George, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, thank you. I'm all set. Okay. Um, Al? I, uh, sorry if I missed this in the presentation. Could you explain, uh, Pete, for someone how traffic duty gets assigned and fits in the to the staffing model there over time or patrol or what it is? Uh, do you mean traffic enforcement? I mean, like the DPW is cutting a tree down and there's a police officer standing there directing oh, traffic. Gotcha. Those are uh, those are private details and those are hired and paid for by either the town department that's doing the work or the contractor that's doing uh, the work. So Verizon, National Grid, et cetera. But they're not a police officer? It's a police officer. It does not come out of the police budget though. I'm oh, sorry, so it is a police officer, on, on, but it's fun, you're saying it's, it's sort of like overtime, but it's funded by the job? Correct, yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a set detail rate uh, per the contract and uh, the contractors uh, pay that rate um, for the officer to be uh, either Another on a security, knock on the door. A security or a, a traffic detail. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, Brenda? Sorry. Um wanted to first of all commend uh, the police department for taking the initiative to, to start a fleet of hybrid vehicles, but wanted to ask what, uh, since I think you are the town department with the fleet and therefore different officers using that fleet, what's the adoption been like? Have uh, staff been comfortable with the hybrids? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Brenda. They've been extremely uh, well received. So uh, at first, obviously there was some, um, you know, hesitation about uh, us uh, moving the fleet over to hybrid, but once the officers ha uh, started driving them, um, you know, they perform uh, slightly differently than a regular car, but they still have all the performance um, and uh, safety features that the other police rated vehicles have. So it's been, it's been very well received by the officers. Thank you. Um, and I, I believe historically the police department requests replacement vehicles on a three out of every four year cycle, something like that. That's correct. We're, we're currently uh, looking at that um, and working with capital and getting a, uh, an updated vehicle replacement plan. Uh, okay. But that's typically been what we do. Um, and then there's, there's been typically a, uh, one no buy year out of the uh, five year plan. Oh, a five year plan. Okay. So are you expecting that the hybrids will be continued to be requested in future vehicle time request times? Absolutely. We're requesting uh, all hybrids this uh, fiscal year also. Thank you. You're welcome. Dave, Dave Lane, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. This is not necessarily a budget question except as it relates to training and, and outreach. Uh, but I'm curious, particularly given some of the events over the weekend, the extent to which the police department has reached out to local religious institutions or houses of worship for um, sort of safety and security assessments and also what kind of training, uh, if any officers are receiving to deal with those kinds of situations like we saw in, in Texas? That's a great question. Um, 
I we have been in contact with um, the different religious institutions in town. Um, I as a public meeting, I don't want to go into specifics about what our response has been. Sure. Uh, but needless to say, we we have um, you know altered and adjusted the way that we uh, were operating. Um, as far as the training question, the officers uh, constantly receive uh, yearly in service training. Uh, but as trainings come up that relate to um, you know domestic terrorism or extremism. Uh, we do pass that training along uh, to them also. So yes, we, they do get training uh, in incidents like that and what to look for, um, indicators, uh, response, uh, patrol techniques, et cetera, to try to deter uh, that type of activity. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um. Uh, thanks, Julian. Thanks, Chief, for being here and for all the department does. Uh, I actually had a follow-up to Al's question. Um, I, I wondered if you had any data on the extent to which police personnel were able to supplement their salaries through being paid for details. Uh, I don't. Um, it's up to the individual officers if they want to supplement their incomes that way. Um, the detail rate is contractual. Um, so I, I don't have any data on that you're looking for specifically, and I'm not sure uh, how I'd get it because it fluctuates so much depending on the availability of the work, what projects are going on in town, et cetera. Okay, I mean, it seems to me that that's the kind of thing that we see in the Boston Globe all the time. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the, uh, the overall compensation of police officers in, at least larger police departments. And um, I would think it would be of interest not only to this committee, but also to perhaps the, the personnel board, the town administration, to have some of that data. They, they, are, paid, they, they are paid from uh, the town. They're not paid from the police budget, those private details. Um, so I'm sure we could access uh, the payroll information for um, officers that were on detail as opposed to overtime? Well, they're, they're not only paid for by the town, but they're paid for by private contractors. Correct, but the, the town initially pays them and then are reimbursed by the private contractors. So oh, they I are, see. yeah, so we could, we could figure it out. They're not paid directly by the um, private contractor. Okay. Do you think someone could get back to us with that? Yeah, I can work with uh, with Sue uh, Nickerson to get those numbers. Thank you. Absolutely. Andy? Yeah, uh, not to, to, to be the, not to be the dead horse, um, but uh, my question, my general question was, are you able to determine whether there are any particular factors uh, that have prevent you from attracting people to work uh, overtime rather than continuing uh, with the, the mandatory shift coverage so that you, you end up with so many people doing 16 hour shifts. So, so that's my, my, my general question is, are you able to identify the, some factors and, and would one of those factors be uh, paid details? private details. Yeah, first, uh, Andy, I love your background as always. It's always uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> secondly, uh, we I have- I was trying to get a new one for this meeting, but I didn't, didn't get it done. No, next time. <laughs> so for, um, you know, the, the reasons for officers not accepting uh, shifts, if you look at that or looked at that graph that we had up there, uh, I noticed that 74% of those shifts are on uh, the midnight shift. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, officers aren't, um, you know, thrilled about working that shift. So if they have, they could either be working the day shift the next day or the four to 12 shift. Um, and when an overtime opportunity comes up, which sometimes it's not uh, with a lot of advance notice, because it could be a, you know, a personnel day or a sick day, et cetera. Um, there isn't a lot of notice. So officers have plans the following day 
they, they have families, other obligations. So um, a lot of it comes down to uh, notification on, on shifts like that. And if, if we get them out ahead of time, if we know about the opening, I think we have a better chance of filling those shifts. Um, the officers are also, uh, you know, sort of burnt out with the amount of overtime shifts that we have. Um, so like the fire department, we're struggling with recruitment and retention. Um, we currently have, I believe it's 50 uh, of our 53 positions filled. Uh, of those 50, we have two uh, personnel out on uh, long-term um, on the job injury. So we actually have 48 people. Uh, we did just hire five um, recruits, but we won't see them on the road and counting towards Manning for probably uh, end of October next year. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's sort of a, a summary of the overtime and the, and the uh, uh, you know, attractiveness of the shift is, is obviously an issue, but also the officer's schedules and, and lives outside of work, um, you know, sort of plays into that. As far as details, um, I, I don't think so because, you know, officers could either, you know, I don't know about you, but I'd rather be in a patrol car <laughs> than standing on the road in the middle of winter. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, there is, you know, an attraction to details because you know ahead of time um, when the detail officer that, that fills those shifts, uh, they know often ahead of time, often in advance of when we'd know when an overtime shift is coming up. Um, so they're filled in advance. They already have that shift, so now they're not eligible to take um, to take a uh, uh, a patrol shift. So if if there's, there doesn't appear to be any particular uh, factor, uh, uh, which sort of suggests that there might be a bit of a uh, a circular or a chicken and egg problem. I mean, if you know that you're highly likely to be forced to work overtime. You're, you're probably not a frame of mind to do too much voluntary volunteering for overtime on top of that. So I guess until we fulfill your staffing needs, that, that problem is not going to be going to be solved. Right. It's sort of a, it's a mix of, of a bunch of different factors that come together and cause the, the overtime. Okay. And uh, I, I take it, I should not read anything into the fact that the, the defibrillator stipends went down, but the <laughs> ammunition expense went up. No, <laughs> definitely not. And that, that defibrillator stipend is actually, um, initially that was for the officers to be trained and use uh, and carry the defibrillators. It's, it's now encompasses a lot more than that. It's, um, it should probably be titled either a medical stipend or something like that because it covers uh, they're training and use of Narcan, for example, and, you know, all the other equipment that they carry uh, that's related to, to the medical end of their jobs. So we should probably change that from defibrillator. So, um, and the, the cost of, of ammo and, and training equipment, um, you know, not only is it, is it becoming um, difficult to obtain, <coughs> price has also gone up uh, significantly. So, um, Sort of the reason for that one. Thank you. You're welcome. Sarah. Hi. Um, this is a. I'm. <laughs> sometimes everything I say, I feel like I should say I'm new here. So maybe everybody knows this, but me. Um, it's just occurring to me. Where do you get your fuel? Uh, does the town purchase it as a whole for, say, police, fire, school buses, etc.? Or um, yeah. That you're absolutely correct, Sarah. It's a purchase by the town, um, and it's for all um, all departments that I'm aware of. It's diesel and regular gasoline. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. It's at the bus depot. That's what I thought, and I wasn't able to go on the tour, so I probably missed that too on the tour. Um, but yeah, I, I figured it's probably not just at the local mobile station. <laughs> now the, the school the school has a contract, Sarah. They buy in bulk and quantity, and then okay. the school department uh, bills out to every department because each department has a key log to get into the gas station okay. to get the gas. Okay. Thank you. 
What's the school's profit margin on that, Sue? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna silence my uh... Does anyone else have any other questions for Chief Jones or for Nancy about the police budget? Andy, I take it your hand is just left over, hand up. Yes, okay. So Nancy, um, you have the new numbers, uh, the corrected numbers. So do you wanna give a recommendation? Yes, so I recommend a budget of salaries of 6,700,439. Expenses of four, Hundred thousand eight hundred eighty-six thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars in expenses for a total budget of seven million one hundred eighty-seven thousand one hundred eighty-nine dollars. All right. Well, thank you for coming out tonight, Chief Jones, and for the other um, police uh, attendees. And uh, appreciate you taking us through uh, the budget. Sorry, there was a little bit of a snafu about different numbers, but. We're back on track, so. Oh, no problem, Julie. Thank you to uh, you and your team for your support and uh, your time tonight. All right. So next up, I guess, Chief, you're probably not going to go anywhere because we have the animal control budget and we have um, Leslie Badger, who is a local celebrity in her own right with the uh, animals and animal lovers in our town. So um, I did check the uh, Dropbox versus the print um, on the uh, animal control budget and it is, um, it's the same. Okay, thank you. That's me for animal control. And it's nice, it's nice that the numbers are, are the same since those are the ones the public safety task forces were, this public safety group has worked with. So uh, nice to have Leslie here. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna go through the numbers a bit. And then Leslie's going to present her slides and tell us about her work and her um, and some of her work involving famous animals on the South Shore, at least this past year. And um, and then we'll take questions at the end of that. So this is really a a flat budget. Um, so just um, to keep that in mind, there is an increase in salary. Um, and that increase is a total of $4,546.19, which I think is around 6.39%. Um, and, um, and that, as you can see on the second page, relates um, to one, just the, the differences we see in salary uh, with, with all of the things we've heard about over and over again, and also a longevity. Um, amount as well. So the total for um, um, salaries is $75,696. And I should say you will see some part-time people there. And the part-time people are people who particularly help in the summer uh, and particularly help with some of um, the increased things that relate to Bear Cove and sometimes are hired from the Harbor Masters part-time staff as well. So some people um, in, engaged in that. Um, the expenses are the, the same um, and there's not really anything there that's great except you might have noticed there, there is no fuel expense and that might surprise you because uh, Leslie has a vehicle in which uh, she travels, but that's because the fuel is in the general police budget and not specifically in, in her budget. So just so if there's any question about that. Um, so that makes the total budget $81,896, uh, which would be an increase of uh, about 5.88%. Um, so I think that's all really, I, I have to say, I did talk to Leslie about whether her budget sort of is, is appropriate for the work that she's doing. And it is, she is hoping that the Capital Outlay Committee will um, prioritize her request for a, a new truck. Uh, but that's, so that's an, a need that's being dealt with in a, in a separate process. So Leslie, if you wanna take away your, your, with your slides. Thank you, Davaline. I appreciate your help with that. 
Hi, all. Thank you so much um, for allowing me to be here tonight to talk about what I do in animal control. Um, as the animal control officer here in Hingham, I'm in charge of um, responding to and helping with all injured, sick, um, and deceased animals that are on town property or in town of Hingham roadways. Um, and I help with um, whether it's reuniting loose or missing dogs. Um, I handle helping with um, um, livestock, marine mammals, and wildlife as well. I'm, I'm fully trained in all of those areas and Hingham is very diverse and we actually do hit um, all those different species of animals. Um, I work, um, I'm working, I'm still working with the coyote project that I put together um, because obviously our town has wildlife um, that lives here. And as most of you know, we even had a bear that came through and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I, I make sure that I still offer the coyote program um, and educate people as much as I can. I'm um, patrolling Bear Cove Park as well for the off-leash program. Um, I help with the hoarding task force. Um, this past year, I provided mutual aid for um, Hingham Hall and Cohasset. Mutual aid is when they need emergency only response if they don't have an ACO on duty. And what happened this year was their ACO uh, moved to another town and they didn't have anyone. So from January to August, I covered for those three towns. And then um, as of this past week, Hull I think is finally um, hiring someone. So I'm back to just doing Hingham and um, only helping if they if the new ACOs that are in place um, need mutual aid or if they go on vacation or are out sick because they do the same for me. Um, if I'm on vacation or if I need extra hands to help with a case or um, I'm out sick. Um, I also helped in providing coverage um, for Rockland, Hanover, Abington and Pembroke this last year. Um, and one of my favorite things that I like to do is community outreach, and that's helping with the uh, Veterans Department, Elder Services, 4-H, um, the Boy and Girl Scouts. Um, so I try and get involved even with the schools as well with education, outreach, um, any way that I can. Um, so the next slide. Um, I'm also the animal inspector. That's another part of my job as the animal inspector every year. Um, the state requires that we um, uh, make sure that there are uh, barn inspections, kennel inspections um, that are performed. If we have dog bites, we, uh, the animal inspectors uh, make sure that quarantines are issued. And then I work hand in hand with the town clerk, making sure the dog's licensing program is up to date. So the next slide I'm ready for. So see, these are some of the photos of over this last year. Um, of different things that I dealt with. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, that is actually a hour old baby coyote that I got a call for. They thought it was a pup they found on a trail um, right on the Hingham Cohasset line. Uh, and when I got there, I was even fooled at first. So it's a, it's a great thing to add to um, my educational coyote program because a lot of people don't realize it's not um, often that you see a baby coyote especially one that would still have the cord attached and was only maybe an hour old. Um, and then we had a cat a while back that got stuck in that vehicle. And that's why I'm in on top of the vehicle, um, reaching down in the cat was perfectly fine. It was taken for a walk on the beach and realized that it was not one that enjoys long walks on the beach and ran back to the vehicle and climbed up under the the hood and got stuck with its leash um, in the fan blade area, but the car was never turned on. So the cat was not hurt. It just took a lot of work between me and Harbor Mobile and Thomas Autobody to get the cat out. Um, two very big cases we had this year that made the news was the iguana that was found in the engine compartment, another animal um, at, down at Hull DPW in one of their pickup trucks. Uh, one of the DPW workers, um, was trying to turn the car on and realized something was off. So he opened the hood and the four foot iguana was staring at him. We discovered that someone obviously dumped the iguana. We were able to get it out and I brought it to the wildlife center. They were able to um, treat it 
get it back to good health. And um, they helped me find a home for it. And then even bigger story that we had in Hingham was Boo Boo the Bear. Um, he made his way all around the South Shore. And he even took uh, a detour into Hingham for a couple of days, um, enjoyed some of the local bird feed cuisine that we have here in Hingham, uh, and then made his way on uh, and continued down all the way almost to the Cape. Um, and then, as you can see, I, with, I'm handling all different kinds of things. We had the injured swan that was out on the other side of the uh, Cushing Pond and I kayaked out. Um, a neighbor was kind enough to allow me to use their, their kayak and I was able to kayak and get the swan and bring it back. Unfortunately, it didn't survive, but um, I was able to get it to the hospital and they did attempt to try and save it, but he was uh, far too injured from flying into a glass window. Um, so I'm ready for the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So my uh, benchmarks for this past year, as you can see, I um, divided up from what my calls were for the town of Hingham, 253, and then uh, all together, and then for Hingham, 204, Cohasset, 16, Norwell, 13, and Hull, 20, and again for Hull, Cohasset, Norwell, it was mutual aid and um, responding, which was responding to emergencies that their officers couldn't handle. Um, and then because of COVID and um, the courts and everything, I had two citations, um, 35 quarantines, 103 loose dogs, barn inspections, or 16 and five kennel inspections. Next slide, please. <coughs> and then as always, excuse me, um, my key initiatives is to continue to promote the off-leash uh, program at Fairco Park and making sure people follow that, the coyote program. <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, and the dog licensing program for the town of Ingham. And then um, I also want to start working on some programs with the Hingham Police Department and the fire department on animal handling at, with a lot of our livestock. We have quite a few different setups of barns, some big ones, some small ones. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm interested in doing. And then um, as always, more community outreach for the children's adults, elderly and veterans in the town and um, continuing on some kind of social media page for animal control to make things a little more organized and um, continuing to offer whatever educational things I can with all the resources that we are lucky to have in this area. Next slide, please. And then we went over my expenses and, and all of that. So um, that would be the end of my, my slideshow. So thank you everyone for taking the time to listen. I appreciate it. All right, so I'm really interested in that social media presence because it seems to me from what I see on Facebook, uh, anytime there's a dog loss, Leslie Badger's name is there. And I asked Chief Jones and Leslie if she actually, if it was true, she had photographs of every dog in Hingham <laughs> so that she could study them and learn all their names because it is amazing how the extent to which she knows them. Um, so I see we have a couple of questions. So I'll turn it back to Julie for, for that. Um, yeah, Andy, you had your hand up. Yeah, I listened uh, to your presentation, Leslie, the other night to the selectmen, uh, and, and you were a rock star as you Thank were you. again tonight. But there were two things that you mentioned then uh, I, I wanted to bring up tonight. One is you you didn't tell us, as you did tell the selectmen, that you gave the four foot iguana a uh, an opportunity for a quote great iguana life. Yes, <laughs> the selectmen were very pleased with that. And I also wanted to extend a, a thank you for chasing all of the coyotes from Hingham into Cohasset. That's really absolutely. <laughs> I'm trying my best to move them on to other towns. Bob. <laughs> um, yeah, Leslie, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for being here. I know last year we had a, a, a kind of feel-good ending to the swan story on Cushing Pond with the, the, the new cygnets that were born. And yes. we, we had a, we had a, uh, a less uh, happy story about a week ago. Where, oh, no. Uh, where coyotes apparently killed a deer out on the ice. I did hear uh, about that. But a bald yeah. eagle showed up. And, uh, you know, I understood it was really 
kind of like the Wild West. And I, I wondered, I know Andy to tribute you for uh, chasing all the coyotes in the Kiowasset, but it seems like there are still a few around. Are we seeing more of that kind of thing happen? We, even though if we, the presence is down and we're not having as many sightings, coyotes are still here. The wildlife is still here because it, it's just how it is. But sometimes the they larger presence of them starts to change because they're following the food sources. Um, but definitely Cushing Pond area, Wampatuck area um, have a lot of still good areas of um food sources and unfortunately that was the deer um, that probably had something that was going wrong with it and wasn't able to get away especially on the ice it's very hard for for deer to move with their hooves over ice so it's an unfortunate thing to see but yes it is kind of like watching National Geographic story um, kind of a thing but I did hear and I um, did see some pictures I tried to go down but I was too late um, there was a bald eagle that was also feeding off of the deer I believe too so um, we definitely we also in light we do have bald eagles as well in town so Hingham is very diverse as wildlife that's for sure okay thank you you're welcome any other questions for Leslie Badger or Questions about the budget? Okay, then can, um, Dabling, can you give a recommendation? Yes, so for the animal control budget, I recommend salaries in the amount of $75,696, expenses in the amount of $6,200 for a total budget, operating budget of $81,896. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Leslie. And, um, Thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks, Thank again, you. Chief, thanks again, Chief Jones and uh, Deputy Chief O'Shea and Lieutenant Petiti for joining us tonight. Thank you. All right, so next on our agenda, we have the recreation budget, which is Bob's budget. Yes, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mark Thorell, our Recreation Director, and Vicki Donlin, the, the Chair of the Recreation Commission, uh, that do such a phenomenal job year after year. I'll, I'll try to keep this fairly short. Um, salaries are basically going up by $9,264.08, or an 8.45% increase. And that, again, is due to uh, the wage and classification study that led to a well-deserved increase in pay for Mark. And, hey, Nancy, uh, do we have a slide for um, recreation? Sorry. Ah, all right, great, thanks. Sorry to interrupt. She, and and expense, expenses are going up by 10539 or 6.17%, and, and that is uh, largely due to increased field maintenance responsibilities that recreation has taken on. There's a, an additional request of $75,000, and, and, and uh, 73,500, and, and that uh, again relates to uh, potential field maintenance responsibilities. Um, uh, and I think the last thing I'd like to observe before I turn it over to uh, Mark and Vicki is that um, it, it would be beyond the scope of anything we talked about tonight to talk about every single program that recreation runs, but they generate over $1 million to cover the expenses of those programs, which do an incredible job for the town of Hingham. And so with that, I will turn it over to our visitors. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thanks for having us here tonight. One quick point on the budget sheet that we were just uh, looking at is we did modify our additional request um, and scaled it down to $27,600. And certainly as I get through the budget presentation, um, 
I, I can explain the 27,000, but but that is a, an update uh, to it that I'm not sure if um, was relayed to the advisory committee or not, but it, okay, there we go. It's down to the 27,600 there. Um, so that's correct, yeah. the way it, you're seeing it right now, Mark? Yes, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so I guess I'll just jump right into our pre presentation. Um, our operating budget consists of uh, two items, the director's salary and the new townwide turf maintenance plan. Most of our self-supporting fiscal operations happens within our revolving fund budget. Our scope of programs helps bring in revenue, which in turn pay for all the department's expenses and payroll. Our mission and scope of services include the following. With regards to programming, we manage a comprehensive range of over 200 self-funded recreational programs for all generations. Just to highlight a few of our larger programs so you can get a sense of our curriculum. With the adult population, some programs include tennis, pickleball, dance cardio, harbor hoops, spinning, yoga, Zumba, and golf. We also offer a commercial grade fitness room that is open seven days per week. Free memberships are provided to any Hingham resident 75 years or older. Our children's program consists no, of a no. dance. <laughs> Our children's program consists of a dance program that averages over 650 dancers. We have 300 children enrolled in kid kicker soccer, 200 children in tennis, 200 girls in field hockey, okay. and over 100 children in our track and field program. We offer seven different summer camps, which enrolled 3,300 children in summer 2021. We employ about 100 to 125 seasonal staff members to have these popular programs uh, staffed. The camps include offerings for three to 13 year olds. We added two additional camps for summer 2021. Parkland was offered for eight to 12 year olds. This camp took advantage of Hingham's beautiful parklands, which included exploring Wampatuck, Bear Cove, Hingham Harbor, and World's End. This program was a hit as it filled every week that it was offered. We plan on expanding this program for summer 2022. Adventure Club was a new camp offered to fourth and fifth graders. We realized our enrollment numbers were decreasing for this age group and that we needed to offer something that appealed to this age bracket. This camp includes three field trips per week, which include but not limited to kayaking in Hingham Harbor, visiting Nantasket Beach, rock climbing, paintballing, and visiting a variety of trampoline parks. Over 850 teens participated in our Teen Extreme program, which takes four field trips per week at some of the most extreme parks in New England. The teens traveled to Six Flags, Water Country, Canopy Lake Park, the Godzilla Speedboat in Boston Harbor, and Treetop Climbing Adventures. This was just a few of the 2021 Teen Extreme trips. Um, slide two, please. With the new town-wide athletic field and court plan, Hingham Rec now permits and schedules all town fields and courts. This consists of 37 fields at 16 locations, 28 tennis courts at six locations, locations and 10 basketball courts over seven locations. Every permit from every sports organization is scheduled and uploaded into our comprehensive rec software where the public has the ability to view open time slots at every field. This has helped create efficiency and transparency to the permitting and scheduling process. The rec department also manages and oversees the athletic turf maintenance for all town athletic fields, which consist of 68 acres. For FY 2022, the newly funded budget in total was 381,000. 241,000 was funded by the town, 40,000 was transferred from the school's budget to the turf maintenance budget, and 100,000 was collected in user fees. The new town turf maintenance budget was the result of a total team effort, both from the sports community and town officials. It took buy-in from every sports organization to agree to a whole new fee structure, which resulted in higher rates. Everyone across the board was cooperative, understanding, and flexible. Slide three, please. 
managing the town's athletic field turf maintenance consists of scheduling and oversight of field applications, irrigation, utilities, infield groomings and renovations, seating, top dressing, aerating, and a variety of other field services. We have hired several athletic field staff members who have taken great pride in grooming baseball and softball infields. The turf maintenance program has been well received by the sports community and we are really confident that we will be able to continue to improve the overall playing conditions at all fields townwide. Next slide, please. I wanted to share the positive results that the town has seen in just six months. A picture of Cronin Field has been provided to illustrate the field improvements. You can see the quality of turf in the beautifully maintained infield. The work and impact of the turf maintenance budget did not go unnoticed as the, as the president of Hingham Little League noted in his email. He was very pleased with the improved field conditions. Next slide, please. Here is a picture of Haley Field in Lynchfield. New infield mix was installed, baselines were edged in the home plate area and the pitcher's mounds were rebuilt to proper size and specs. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of Foster and South Schools. You can see the dramatic difference between the before and after pictures. Both infields were fully grown in with vegetation. This was removed and the infield was completely groomed and edged out. This is a work in progress as some of the vegetation has grown back but once again in the spring, we will remove it for the season. Next slide, please. More before and after pictures at Hingham High School. It is important to note that the town has partnered with a professional firm who has been extremely responsive, professional, and has performed nothing but quality work. Next slide, please. This graph represents that other than the director's salary, our department is self-funded. One statistic we take pride in is that we offer summer camps from the day Hingham's children end their school year all the way up until the weekend before they start their new school year. Many comparative towns offer six or eight weeks of summer camps. In summer 2021, we offered 11 weeks. And next slide, please. A few of our key initiatives include helping the South Shore Country Club with their potential future pool project in any way that we can. We also hope to improve accessibility at athletic fields, courts, and playgrounds. And finally, we hope to work with the schools and board of selectmen's office to identify and create a townwide capital priority list. Next slide, please. The REC's total salary is $189,000, uh, which consists of the director's salary and the payroll for the turf maintenance staff. Our three other full-time administrators are fully funded by the revolving fund. The REC Commission and I are so fortunate to have such a dedicated, hardworking administrative team. We have three full-time administrators who are extremely efficient and motivated to serve the residents of Hingham. We have an additional 12 summer administrators who help us manage all of the seasonal employees. Our admin team excels at successfully marketing, growing, and managing very large and complex recreational offerings. We are incredibly lucky to attract some of the hardest working, brightest, and dedicated counselors and lifeguards. We typically select 100 to 125 counselors and lifeguards to cover our summertime needs. And um, the, the total expenses for the town's turf maintenance plan is $181,000. And all other department expenses are self-funded from the revolving fund. And finally, the last slide. An additional funding request of 27,600 represents a spring and fall cleanup at all the athletic fields. The new townwide turf maintenance budget does not include seasonal landscaping at athletic fields in the parking lots connected to the fields. This work would include cutting back brush from the fence line and parking lots, de-weeding mulch beds and parking lots, removal of brush and weeds from the backstops, dugouts and bleachers. Over the years, some of the fields have been so overgrown with brush that team softball benches cannot be used and a prime example of this is over at Foster School, 
and still today, if you walk behind Foster School, the softball players literally can't use the, the benches yet just because of all the overgrown um, brushes going right through the, the benches. So the 27,600 would truly go a long way in helping to maintain and clean up fields in the parking lots that are associated with each field. We appreciate your time tonight and, and thank you for your support. And Bob, I'll throw it back towards you or to see if any committee members have any questions. Uh, is, 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 is Vicky you want to add anything? Well, the only thing I wanted to uh, add, uh, Bob, and I think everybody has seen the uh, change in the fields. Uh, we were so fortunate the town meeting voted for this um, cooperation between the three departments, the select board, the rec department, and the school department to make this happen. And we hit the ground running in July 1st. So everybody has seen that, but I, I, I'm most proud. And I think uh, future generations will see that one of the best things that has come out from this is that the rec department, the school department, and the select board are working really well together. And those are things that, uh, as you all know, um, are the most important advances that we can make in any uh, town or city, because when departments all work together, uh, it, it only benefits all the citizens. So I just wanted to share that because I'm really proud of that. Well, thank you, Mike and Vicki and all the members of the Rec Commission that do such a great job. Uh, and I'll turn it back to Julie to feel to recognize people for questions. All right, thanks, Bob. Andy, you have your hand raised. I, I just wanted to congratulate Mark and, and Vicki. I mean, the Recreation Department is a, a shining star and, and those fabulous service to the town. And another rock star, Mark, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Kristen? Yes, um, hi, Mark. Um, I just had a quick question. I remember last year when you were presenting um, for, the, for the field maintenance and mentioned that like other towns weren't really interested in renting um, our fields because of the, the state that they were in. Have you seen any increased revenue um, now that the fields are in such better shape? Um, in a way, I think it might have been the opposite where our own Hingham sports programs weren't able to use some of our fields where they were starting to permit into other towns. So um, I believe some Hingham youth soccer divisions were playing home games in Cohasset. Um, so so I, I think we, we will eventually um, come this spring. Um, I mean, I've already talked to a couple of the youth presidents, uh, the president of Hingham Youth La Lacrosse, where um, they've taken a look at the high school fields where they play, and the initial request was to play on a different field, but once she saw the improvement over at the high school fields where the lacrosse fields are, she automatically said, oh, th this is so much better than it was, we're, we're ready to play for the spring. So yeah, they're definitely already starting to see an improvement. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. George? <laughs> ah, there I am. Uh, thank you, Mark. Great, uh, great presentation and, uh, and great work you guys are doing. Um, if memory serves me correct, Mark, one of the findings in the field study was that um, the town does not have um, designated pickleball courts and that pickleball is apparently one of the fastest growing sports in the, in the country. And I wonder if on a long-term basis um, you all have plans to um, to build uh, uh, just, uh, pickleball courts? It's definitely on our radar and, and we know that was duly noted by Weston and Sampson in the, in the field study. So we, we definitely support it. Um, it is one of the $17 million of recommendations Weston and Sampson made. So, um, but, but we do know um, pickleballers are a passionate group and um, 
they they would highly advocate for dedicated pickleball courts and and, and we support it. Um, I guess it's just a matter of kind of creating a priority list on and where that falls within it, but but certainly we would support that. Okay. Thank you. Sarah. Hi, hi Mark and Vicki. Um, thank you so much. Um, rec is like my literal favorite topic. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to really thank you for the fields improvements. My own kids have benefited so much. Um, and my husband's on the girls softball board and we did so much power walking around town during COVID, Vicki, you would, you would appreciate, we walked by your neighborhood <laughs> a lot. Uh, and every time we were there, we saw people, you know, maintaining the fields and particularly the softball fields. It is so impressive what you have done. Um, and so many girls have benefited. So thank you, that's it. Oh, thank you. I, I'm the Thanks. lucky one who gets to talk, talk about the, the <laughs> but really it's a total team effort with, <laughs> Uh, multiple departments and a, a, a lot of staff members. Um, I'm just kind of the lucky one who helps be a spokesperson for it, but, but thank you for the kind words. Dave? Um, yeah, quickly, Mark, Vicki, thank you guys again. It's been said a couple of times, but it can't be said too often how great a job you guys do, thank you. Um, this is, I guess, budget related. It's a little bit tangential, but I, I missed, the CPC meeting, but I noticed the final votes and I noticed if I'm correct that the Cronin Field Basketball Court project was not funded. And I just wondered while we got you here, what what you know what do you think that means in terms of next steps for you as it relates to that that asset and and um, you know whether that has budgetary impacts for you as you look into your crystal ball into the next year or two. Sure. So out of the two projects, we did tell them we, we our highest priority was the, the street hockey court. One, we felt like that that court was uh, um, in, in worse shape than the basketball one. And Hingham only has one street hockey court. Um, so they just because of their budget, they were just able to fund, fund the one project or so far had the votes for the one project. Um, there are some things we can do. We can do another patchwork on, on some of the cracks. They're getting pretty wide to keep on doing patchwork. That's why we were kind of requesting the full reconstruction. But to get us through another year, we can certainly take a look at filling in the cracks and, and once again, um, piecing it together for, for another year. Um, and, and so that's most likely probably the, the best option uh, for, the, for the next year. And what's the order of magnitude of the of the repair work, the kind of stopgap stuff? Is that tens of ten thousand bucks, or is it twenty? Or, I mean, ballpark. It, it's a very band aid uh, approach. It would probably be a four or five thousand dollars. Okay. You, okay. We're talking about probably a a one year band aid. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions? for our, the recreation budget. Okay, then Bob, can we have a recommendation? Yeah, I'm pleased to recommend the FY23 recreation budget salaries of $189,908 and expenses of $181,319. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're finally on to the library budget. I know that some library folks have been on our meeting for quite a while tonight and uh, thanks for your patience. But we will go ahead now with the library budget. And I did a quick check of the Dropbox file versus the print file and looks like they match up. So we shouldn't have trouble. Uh, we shouldn't have trouble with that. Um. Thank you, Julie. This is uh, uh, my budget. <clears throat> uh, allow me to introduce uh, Linda Harper, who is the executive director of the library. Uh, also on the call, I believe, is Lucy Hancock, who's the chair of the library's board of trustees, as well as David Mahegan, who is the vice chair. So we, we, we welcome you. 
And uh, I, I think it might make sense if we uh, reverse the process with regard to the library. And if I ask Linda Harford to present her slide deck first, uh, which includes uh, information on the uh, uh, mission and services, the uh, benchmarks and metrics, key initiatives, and finally staff and expenses. And when she concludes with the staff and expenses, uh, then I can uh, go back uh, into the budget numbers themselves, if that's okay, Julie. Yeah, however you want to do it. Okay, Linda. That's great. Thank you very much, Andy. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to mention uh, we have another trustee um, joining us tonight. The um, the uh, treasurer of the library, Jeremy Parker, is also on the call. Um, so for mission and services, this tells us a lot about what we do. Um, I know a lot of you have seen me before and you're somewhat familiar with the library, but I just wanna kind of highlight some of the important things that we do um, around the year for all our residents. Um, some of the things we do is we offer responsive services delivered in an efficient and effective manner. Um, these things include providing physical and digital materials and that helps people with their education and personal enrichment. We nurture personal growth. We help people um, research things. They help stimulate their intellectual curiosity. And um, very importantly, we encourage lifelong learning um, for people of all ages. We encourage early childhood literacy. We also enable individuals of all ages to basically explore their world through all kinds of informational and educational programs and displays. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we also provide service on equal terms to all individuals in the community, and we work towards the development of the individual as a citizen. We provide open, accessible, collaborative environment, and it's very supportive of equity, diversity, and inclusion. We're a community center and destination where residents of all ages can meet to exchange ideas, discuss issues, and enjoy a nonpartisan atmosphere. And we offer a diverse collection of print, media, and electronic materials, basically to meet our patrons' recreational, educational, and informational interests and needs. These include both popular titles as well as literary classics. So in the next, next slide, please. Um, so in the response to the pandemic, I wanna mention a few things about our, our benchmarks and, and metrics. As many of you know, things changed a lot during this past year during COVID. Um, we were closed and had to adapt our services um, in response to the pandemic. Doing so, some of the things we offered, we uh, uh, found ways to still get materials out to people, both physically and digitally. We put in a new contact <laughs> pickup service um, with self-checkout. We also eliminated, the big news is we eliminated fines on all our overdue items, um, which a lot of patrons really enjoy. We also have increased our digital um, in, uh, holdings, our digital programs, which we had really never done before. We've really focused, focused a lot on in-person programs. And while we've also had a lot of electronic and digital collections, when we were closed during the pandemic, it became very clear how vital that those services are um, when people had to connect to their library, get information, and they had to do it from their own home. During that time, we found that in-home usage had very strong attendance um, at our programs and the digital collections as well, steady increases across the board. Some of the ones I wanna highlight is our ebook usage increased from 27,000 items, and that's how many times an item is checked out in fiscal 19, to 36,000 in fiscal 20, to 51,000 in fiscal 21. Our e-audio, which is our, you know, like the books on CD, the books that you listen to, you can get in downloadable version as well. Um, so the e-audio collection, the audio books, movies, music, they increased from about 10,000 in fiscal 19 to 14,000 in fiscal 20 to over 18,000 checkouts in fiscal 21. And brand new to the library were the online virtual programs. Um, like all of us, we moved to a Zoom format, an online format, YouTube format. Um, we had to find a way to reach out and connect 
programs to people and give people opportunities to still attend things like author talks, lectures, book groups, story times for the kids when they're stuck at home, family events, technology classes. We did a lot with Zoom tutorials during the pandemic. We taught people how to get onto Zoom and we all did it um, from remotely and, and successfully. We offered arts, crafts, cooking classes, and programs. We offered all of these things a number of 587 times. And during those, we had 6,243 people who attended or viewed the programs. So during a time when people were really isolated, we gave people ways to connect. Next slide, please. Um, despite the pandemic in fiscal 21, our patrons also continued to borrow physical items, and they did this very safely through our contactless holds pickup system, borrowing a total of 160,000 physical items, and that's in addition to the 85,000 digital items. And some of these things include over 72,000 books that were checked out, over 2,600 magazines that were checked out, and over 13,000 movies and music that were checked out. In addition to that, into offering the programs, the digital collections, we also have a number of items in the building itself available to borrow in the collections. We have a very diverse physical collection as well as digital collection. These include over 133,000 books, over 29,000 movies and music, over 72,000 ebooks, over 22,000 downloadable, downloadable audiobooks and music over 392 magazine, newspaper, and print subscriptions, and over 866 miscellaneous items. And these include all kinds of things we loan. We loan puzzles, we loan artwork, we loan various technology devices, we loan household gadgets, um, all kinds of things that you could possibly think of. We try to loan it if there is a need. Next slide, please. Key initiatives, some of the key initiatives, we had um, our five year long range plan had recently expired during the pandemic. Um, we got a one year extension as, as the Mass Board of Library Commission, Commissioners did with all libraries who were kind of stuck during pandemic mode. And since then we had a number of surveys, community forums to determine what the library should really focus its resources, its you know time and um, efforts, people, funding, in the next five years. And the five things that came out of all those, all those um, uh, uh, surveys and whatnot were number one, the improvement of physical spaces. Um, as you all know, or probably know, the building itself is over 50 years old. The last renovation was over 20 years old. So we find it's time to do some updates to keep the library comfortable and welcoming. Number two is the expansion of communication and marketing. We do so much and it's amazing how many times people say, I didn't know that you did that. And it, we just need to do a better job at getting the word out that all we do for people of all ages. Number three, growth as a community resource. We find that we are the meeting place in town that everybody can go to. No matter what your age, what your interest, there's always something at the library. And we find a lot of people come into the library just to connect with other people. Um, we really wanna grow our, our space and place in the community to become that resource. Number four, enhancement of collections. As you can see, we have a very expansive collection already, but we find as things change, for instance, the pandemic, we found out how important the digital collections were. Usage change sometimes depending on what people's needs are, and we are, we are dedicated to being responsive to the changing needs of our patients and, and being you know, very flexible in how we fill the, their needs and their requests. Number five, development of funding sources. Um, and this particularly relates to our board of trustees. As, as many of you may know from, from past um, talks that we've had, the trustees contribute um, a significant amount of money towards the materials budget and fully fund the programming budget for the library. So for example, um, in this you know, um, current year, the trustees are contributing about $215,000 towards the materials expenditure. Um, when we get to the budget later, you'll see that's in addition to the town funds. They also spend $14,000 towards um, programs, which are the story times, the author talks, everything that we do to offer to have people come together. The trustees have realized that it's important to develop their funding sources to do fundraising, to try to have revenues come in, particularly because we did go fine free, there was a loss of revenue there. Um, so they are dedicated to um, 
to improving that through our annual fundraising drive and through, um, and this is a, a save the date, um, somewhere in early May, I think the date uh, is a little fluid right now, early May, the library is hoping to have a big um, Beyond the Books fundraiser, um, I believe planned for the front lawn of the library. So more information to come to that, but um, just to put that all in your, in your calendar books. Next slide, please. So as for the budget, some of our requests for this year, salaries and expenses, our salaries we are requesting $1,770,602. That is for 13 full-time personnel and 21 part-time personnel. We have expense request of $411,134. And the major expenses in those lines include our repair and maintenance, which as you can imagine for an older building, you have some repair and maintenance. Utilities, uh, which is some of that driven by uh, rate increases. Books and materials, uh, which I'm sure Andy will explain a little, but is driven by a, a state aid requirement. So the funding is, is done by a formula. And our OCLN network assessment, which is the money we pay to be part of the old colony library network, which you know gives us a lot of benefits like reciprocal lending, as well as um, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure for technology and technical expertise in, in the areas of cataloging and, and circulation. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Andy. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, if, 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 yeah. Uh, this, this is the, uh, the budget page, which is on page 17 behind the cultural and recreation yellow tab in your uh, in your binders. Um, the total salary as, as uh, uh, Linda mentioned is $1,770,602. This is an increase of $173,037 or 10.8% over the Fiscal 22 revised budget. Um, the the director will receive a uh, $45 salary adjustment, as you'll see in her salary. And this is because the new wage and compensation schedule now calculates wages and salaries to four decimal places rather than two. Um, fortunately, most others will receive more significant raises. Uh, the next uh, account number uh, 5130 is uh, wages full time. That's increased by 9797. Uh, other salaries full time, exclusive of custodians, increases by $107,370. Other salaries part time, uh, uh, exclusive of the three part time custodians, will decrease by $30,478. And this is due to the fact that hours were combined from an open position to move a part-time reference librarian to a full-time position. Uh, salaries for the custodians, uh, there are two full-time and three part-time custodians will increase by $79,075. Um, the uh, overtime increases by 6,422. Training and stipends, uh, most of these are dictated by the collective bargaining agreement. They're virtually the same. And longevity increases by $735. The salary increases are the result of two things. One is the uh, Gov HR wage and compensation study that was done and approved by the personnel board. And the second is the completion of the new collective bargaining agreement negotiated between the town and the librarians union. Um, the, uh, as, no, as noted uh, the other night by the chair of the personnel board, wages for town custodians had fallen considerably below the standard used by Hingham when it looks at the 20 municipalities in the wage and salary comparisons. So there was a very significant equity adjustment necessary to bring the custodians up to the town's usual standard before applying uh, uh, any increase. And, and even in that, the librarian, the custodians in the library still are paid somewhat less than the custodians in town hall. Um, 
turning to expenses, total expenses for fiscal 23, of $411,134. This is an increase of $41,336 or 11.2% over fiscal 22 revised budget. And the, the increase is driven primarily by four items. Uh, the first of which is uh, books and periodicals, account uh, number 5250 uh, is increased by $34,590. This deserves a little explanation. Uh, to be eligible for library grants from the Commonwealth, a municipal library must expend on books and periodicals an amount dictated or determined by a formula uh, the state establishes, and this comes to approximately 15% of the total library operating budget. So perhaps somewhat ironically, the library's increase in salaries results, given the state's formula, in an increase in the amount the library has to expend to, for books and periodicals. Um, You'll also note this is an increase, or the 23 number is an increase of 60,460 over fiscal 21 actual expended. Uh, perhaps this should be explained as well. Uh, during fiscal 21, the Commonwealth uh, suspended its uh, mandatory expenditure 15% of uh, operating expenses for books and periodicals. And as a result, the, the the, the library spent much less and was able to uh, give back funds to the town. Uh, the amount you see for books and periodicals is not the total amount actually expended. The trustees of the library maintain an endowment and contribute um, approximately $215,000 well, $215, each year for books and periodicals. Uh, up until 2017, they covered the entire amount of the books and periodicals expense. But that expense, uh, again, driven by the Commonwealth formula, uh, got so high that they, the trustees couldn't pay it all without dipping into their endowment. So they've capped their payments at, at 215,000. They also, as uh, Linda mentioned, uh, pay anywhere between 14 and 20,000 each year for uh, all the programs that the library runs. Um, and, and before I forget, speaking of uh, trustees, Jeremy, I apologize if I'm not introducing you. I didn't see you uh, uh, on the call, but Jeremy is the uh, effectively the CFO uh, for the board. So uh, we are happy to have him. Um, the uh, library uh, is, is very uh, careful as our departments tend to be with their funds. And in, in 2021, uh, with a, a decrease in the amount the library expended for books and periodicals, it spent, it spent what it had to spend to maintain the integrity of its collections. But with that amount, but with a larger amount from salaries due to COVID-19 closures, Library actually turned back uh, uh, $310,000 to, to the town at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so much enough of books and periodicals. The, the next uh, driver of the increase in expenses is the natural gas increase of $3,900. Uh, the natural gas uh, heats the boilers that provide the heat in the library. Uh, repair and maintenance of buildings is up $1,500. Uh, the library calculates this figure by taking the average of the actual expenditures for repair and maintenance of buildings of the previous three years. Uh, the Old Colony Library Network has increased its assessment to us this year by $1,247. Uh, otherwise, expenses are the same or slightly increased, uh, a couple by $500 or less, except for book processing supplies, which are decreased by $1,000. Uh, the total operating budget for fiscal 23 is 
$2,181,736, which is an increase of $214,373 or 10.9% over fiscal 22 revised budget. With that, I turn it back to the chair for questions. Okay, thank you, Andy. Bob, you have a question? Bob, you're giving me the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I did that on purpose, Julie. <laughs> I know, I have to do at least one time in a meeting. <laughs> Uh, uh, Linda, welcome back. Uh, Lucy, great to have you here again. And David and Jeremy, thanks for all you do. My question really doesn't relate so much to this budget as to the big picture for the future. Uh, I think we all recall the great project for <laughs> library capital investment and the great grant opportunity that we had a few years ago that due to uh, belt tightening and unfortunate fiscal restraints, you know, just wasn't in the cards at that point. Uh, are we in the queue for doing something along those lines in the future? Um, that, that, uh, uh, let me uh, answer that for you. So um, thank you for remembering that, that, that was a, a a good endeavor, we gave it our best shot. Um, th those grants come around only every so often. They're not on a regular schedule. It can be every seven years, eight years. Sometimes they skip, sometimes they double up. It all depends on state funding. There's no indication right now of when the next grant round may happen. Um, what they, they're doing is all the people who got grants on the last round, they're still working on filling those. They do so many every year. So that will play out and they'll spend the funds to do that. And then as they start getting those through, hopefully they'll get approved for more funding. Um, when that time comes, I definitely will be working with the trustees to see if that's an opportunity we can um, take advantage of. I think a lot, you know, as we found out last time comes into play of where the town is at that point. I know they were looking at all the other buildings. They still have schools and things like that. So we really need to figure out, I think as a town, you know, what the priorities are so that we can get, you know, the support we need if we decide to do this again. Um, but yes, that would be a wonderful opportunity because that's, you know, free money if we can get it. Um, but so far, no, no uh, grant rounds have been announced, but I will keep my ears to the ground for that one. Thanks, I'll be cheering for the other Thank you. Does anyone else have a question about the library budget for Andy or for Linda or any of the trustees? No questions, I know it's a little bit later, but... <clears throat> Oh, Bob, you're talking, but we, I can't hear you. Oh, you weren't talking. Okay, sorry. <laughs> At his age, he talks to himself on a fairly regular basis. Okay. Um, okay, well, if there aren't any other questions about this budget, then Andy, can we please get a recommendation? I recommend for fiscal 23, uh, total salaries of one million seven hundred seventy thousand six hundred and two dollars. Uh, total expenses of four hundred eleven one hundred thirty four dollars, for a total operating budget of two million one hundred eighty one thousand seven hundred thirty six dollars. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your patience tonight, Linda and the trustees, board of trustees. Thank you. Lucy. Nice seeing you. Lucy, it was nice having you back in the AdCom house for a little while. <laughs> um, so thank you. Good night. Thanks, Andy, and everyone else. Thank you. Okay, so moving on in our agenda tonight. Thanks, everyone, uh, for your um, work so far in the budgets. We have our final budget for the evening, which is the select board budget. And um, I know we have uh, Michelle Montaguer and Tom Mayo 
here to talk about that budget. And we received today uh, an email with updated information. So if people can, they didn't get it, they should check their email um, if they wanna look at those files. So. Okay, be before, uh, uh, again, uh, welcome Tom and Michelle. And, and I think the, the order of presentation uh, I'd like to follow if it's okay with the chair is the same as before. So we'll proceed with the, the slide deck showing the uh, mission and services, benchmarks and metrics, key initiatives, and finally salaries and expenses. And when we get to the, uh, the budget numbers, um, I'll, I'll be sure to highlight the numbers that are different from what you may have seen in your either hard copy uh, in the binder or in the, uh, uh, in the Dropbox. Uh, this, for those who have the binders, the select board budget begins on page 65 behind the red general government tab. And uh, with that, I pass the baton to either Tom or Michelle. Great, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, I'm not sure who's running the slides, just so I can know who to talk to. Nancy. Nancy's Nancy, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> okay, um, I will be quick. I'll go through this pretty quick. A lot of this is similar to what you've seen in years past. Um, I think you all know. You know, we we try to manage all aspects of the community's operations, right? So we have 250 plus employees across six unions, 23 departments and eight buildings. A lot of people doing a lot of stuff. You're hearing a lot of those, uh, the things that they do on a regular basis through these budget presentations. Uh, we try to support the employees whenever we can. Um, you know, we also support over 400 um, elected and appointed officials like you all. And that's across some 70 boards and committees. So there's a lot going on um, at any given time. Uh, and we, we try to support everybody as the best we can. Uh, approximately 50 or so select board meetings a year. Um, we have, you know, the big items that are our annual, <laughs> our annual tasks are, you know, the annual budget. That's of course, that's the big one. Uh, we have an annual meeting, uh, town meeting warrant that needs to be put together. And of course, the town report uh, as a component of the warrant. We handle uh, procurement part. One of the several titles that I hold as the, as the town administrator is the chief procurement officer. So I am responsible for all procurement in town. Um, thankfully, you all saw fit to, um, to allow our budget to expand a couple of years ago to include a procurement and contracts manager. Uh, that has been filled in the form of Kathy Riley last year, and she does an amazing, an amazing job at at helping, uh, helping us uh, organize and, and uh, com you know, continue to move through all of the procurement needs that the town has. Um, you know, we managed citizen inquiries. We've got a lot of questions, a lot of comments back and forth um, that we try to respond to in a timely manner. Public records requests, everyone's favorite uh, tasks, but they come in and they need to be responded to. So uh, we do that. Of course, all the licensing, um, uh, process and requests we get before, you know, things like liquor licenses and others, other types of licensing. Um, I work closely with the delegation from the, the, the local delegation to the state house. So that's Joan Moschino um, and Pat O'Connor, our state senator. Uh, and then, of course, we coordinate all four aspects of the, all four of our legal team members. Um, town council and labor council, litigating council and real estate council. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, just real quick on this, you know, we, we all know that the town enjoys a, a triple triple, uh, that's a triple A bond rating from all three major credit rating agencies. This is a slide that just shows that we're one of 15 communities who've been rated a triple A community through uh, Moody's. Okay, Nancy, thank you. Some key initiatives for this year, um, the never ending pandemic, apparently, uh, we'll be dealing with this through my retirement, I feel like, <laughs> about 15 years from now, hopefully not, but uh, it's just, 
all consuming it seems and um, exhausting, but it is what it is and we deal with it. Uh, thanks again to this committee and the Board of Selectmen and town meeting in, uh, in seeing the, the, um, the wisdom in our request last year to fund a second assistant town administrator. This position is just working out fantastic. As you know, we split the, the assistant town meeting, uh, town administrator roles into finance. That's the job that Michelle has taken and does an amazing job at and operations. Um, so, you know, I, I, we've hired a gentleman by the name of Art uh, Robert, who is our ATA of operations. And, and again, he does great work. I'll tell you guys a side story. I was talking to Jim Boudreau, the town manager in Situate the other day. And he was like, I heard you got a second assistant town administrator. I said, yeah, it's really working well. And I said, you know, it's better than getting the position is getting the people in the positions. I have a Harvard trained budgeting expert as my finance director or, or my ATA of finance. And I have a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the, in the army as my operations <laughs> ATA. It just doesn't get better than that. So um, the positions are great, but the people are better. So um, thanks to them for the work they do and all of you for seeing the wisdom in the, in the structure. Um, the sustainable budgeting task force is a big deal. Um, Michelle is really uh, neck deep in that in that work right now, working closely with Liz Klein. Um, they should have a report out in the next couple of weeks that will help guide some of the big decisions that we as a community need to make in the coming months. So looking forward to that report. Um, you know, obviously we have two big debt exclusions looming before us. We heard tonight, um, well, three big debt exclusions looming before us, uh, foster school, public safety facility, and then uh, ultimately the, re, the reconstruction and remake of the senior center. Um, the, uh, we heard earlier tonight that uh, there might be some news on the foster front in terms of what, they, what, what they're bringing forward to town meeting in uh, this spring, and then again, perhaps in the fall. So we'll see where that plays out in the next couple of days. Um, the water transition, you know, a lot of you have heard, but we've owned this water company for over a year. We passed the we passed the year mark a little while, a few months ago. We celebrated it, and uh, we're just doing great work. Uh, Russell Tierney, our, our superintendent over there, is fantastic, and is um and is doing great things. But where he's you know working under budget and on scope and keeping everything that we've been that we said we would do uh, true to form. So he's he's doing great work. Um. You know, one of the things that Art is helping us work with uh, our second floor staff on is the promoting economic development. You know, the, one of the one of the, the the big ways that we, you know, just so I think you all know this, but I'll say it bluntly, we cannot fund the annual budget on two and a half percent alone. Um, you know, Prop two and a half does not provide everything we need to fund the municipal budget. Uh, a big part of the remaining uh, dollars that the town gets comes every year in the form of new growth, and that is a function of economic development. So we need to uh, we need to continue to uh, to work on uh, appropriate economic development measures and uh, and Art and uh, Emily Wentworth uh, as our new community planning director with a specific goal of um, of monitoring uh, you know large plans uh, economic development type efforts uh, in town and South Ingham in particular but elsewhere as well I think the focus of those two positions is really going to help us with that with that effort. Um, we have, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have a, a predictable and coordinated per permitting process on the second floor. So all of our permitting boards, conservation, zoning, planning, uh, all the historic boards, it's really important that, that people understand what those boards do and how they can, uh, how they can, can uh, participate in the regulatory process that those boards manage um, successfully and in a predictable manner. Uh, we always try to use technology wherever we can to make things more efficient. Um, you know, one of the other one of the other things that you guys all uh, again uh, helped us with and funded uh, in the within the last couple of years um, was an in, uh, an enhanced com communications tool. And to that end, we've we've I think you've heard this, but we've um, hired or contracted with a firm called JGPR. That is uh, that comes with a lot of expertise, a lot of individuals that have um, varied expertise, and are available to us to help help the town tell its story. I always tell the department heads we're doing amazing things every every day, but it seemed like for the longest time because we were all department heads, where 
where you know we know how to run a DPW or how to you know you know deal with all the assessing issues or the the town clerk's office and the issues that she deals with on a daily basis. We're not we're not um, journalists and we're not uh, public relations experts. So what we've done is hired a firm that brings that skill to us. We've asked them to engage themselves in the community. Um, they they speak and reach out to the uh, speak with and reach out to the department heads to see what's going on and then they tell the story on a daily basis. Too often the town only hears from uh, the town's residents only hear about issues with the town when something's gone wrong and we're going to fix that. We're going to we're going to let everybody know about the wonderful things that are happening in, in town every day, and uh, and I think we're we're successfully utilizing that um, those enhanced communications uh, now. Green Communities is a big, uh, is a big and growing program. You know, we've received uh, 170 or so thousand dollars in the first round. We've submitted an application for another almost $200,000 in the second round to help us with energy efficiency measures across town. Our new application um, contemplates uh, uh, new programs uh, in town hall and at the high school. So we're making sure that all of our um, of our facilities are sharing in the, the cost saving benefits of energy efficiency measures. And of course, grant opportunities in general, we're always seeking ways to bring outside money into town. And you'll hear a little bit more about that when I get to my additional requests. Nancy? So we're doing all this with, uh, these are corrected numbers. If your, if your sheet shows something different, um, I'm sure Andy will speak to that in a minute, but um, the total salary line is $690,511. That's myself, the two ATAs. Uh, Kathy is the procurement and contracts manager. Of course, you all know, I think Sharon Perfetti is our longtime office manager and Heidi Gall is our executive assistant. And then of course, the three uh, part-time personnel are the three select board members. Uh, we have $116,340 uh, for expenses. I talked about the communications line. Um, you know, we have $27,000 or so for um, property and consulting needs, things that come up during the course of the year that we need to engage with. And then um, we've been utilizing our recording clerks uh, line a little bit more successfully this year than we had in the prior two years. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that that program continuing and, and starting to get um, better used. Nancy? Additional requests. Um, Andy, you want me to keep going through this slide or? Oh, you're muted. The, the answer is yes. Please go through it quickly. I mean, I didn't mean quickly. Please go through it, recognizing yeah. that we are not going to discuss it tonight. But Understood. we want to be aware of it. Well, sure. yeah, I mean, we're not going to recommend it tonight, but we do need to understand what the requests are. Sure. So I'll start out by telling by telling everybody this is kind of one of those weird situations where, you know, I, I have to wear a couple of different hats in this gig. Um, in this instance, I'm wearing the department head of the select board's office, <laughs> not the town administrator. So in that vein, I'm submitting the request for a couple of additional um, a couple of additional positions. I will evaluate all additional requests after this is done when I put, the, put my town administrator hat back on and uh, look at all of the additional requests from all the department heads. And I will uh, evaluate them all uh, according to what I feel where uh, is appropriate to move forward this year. And I'll make my recommendations at that point. Uh, but that will come after the Sustainable Budgeting Task Force um, gives us their, um, their report. So the first one that I'm asking for is a sustainability coordinator. This is someone that would presumably uh, be able to help us with sustainability issues in, in, in general. Those are things like energy efficiency and uh, renewable power and recycling and, uh, and potentially even things like um, uh, resiliency. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of potential issues that would go into this broad spectrum. We need, to, uh, we need to identify what we want the position to actually be able to do um, and then come up with a job description, run it through the, uh, through the personnel board and then have it, um, have it valued within our, um, within our wage and classification program. Uh, this is our best estimate of what the, uh, what the salary would likely 
be for this full-time position. We're assuming it will, it will come out to somewhere around a salary of $72,000. I have spoken with the town of Cohasset and their town, their town manager over there is a fellow named by, by the name of Chris Sr. Um, he and I have talked through this. He also would like to have this, um, this type of position available to him for his town. However, he doesn't, he, he doesn't A, have the funds and B, perhaps isn't sure about the scope of work and what needs to be done. So he's, he would like to start out where, uh, in a reduced role, a part-time role, as I think is appropriate for us. However, Hingham is a significantly larger community than, than Cohasset. So what we agreed was that I would uh, bear the, the cost, uh, about two thirds of the cost of the position and Cohasset would bear the, the remaining third. Um, I think that obviously that would that would uh, extend out to the number of hours that per week that the employee would work. Um, we would find a home for this employee here in Hingham. We would give them an office and a desk. Uh, he would have to find some way to accommodate them in, in Cohasset, but I think their main their main office um, and desk would be here in Hingham. I'll find that for them. So you know, this is a, I think a, a good way to evaluate the need. And then um, we can reevaluate it at this time next year and determine is this, you know, the right, the right uh, model going forward, or do we need to do, you know, less time, more time, uh, is the salary appropriate, et cetera. But we can evaluate that again at this time next year. So that's my recommendation: is that we uh, add forty-eight thousand dollars to my budget for a sustainability, a part-time sustainability coordinator. Uh, and just so you know, that position would be a town of Hingham position and the town of Cohasset would simply pay us um, on, a, on a regular basis the, the cost of, um, of their portion, uh, both salary and benefits, the cost of, that por of their portion of that, uh, of that position. So, so that's the way that would work. Uh, and then a grant writer. <laughs> this is back again. It's been on, it had been on here for several years. It's been off probably for a couple in terms of additional requests. I know my predecessor, Ted Alexiatis, had regularly requested this. Um, the town did not see uh, at the time the, 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 or did not feel that it was appropriate at the time to fund. Um, I've got it back on here because, you know, and for all the same reasons, I, I do believe that there are opportunities to bring in a lot of outside money into town. I will say that we got to be careful with the expectations of that. Grants, while plentiful, are often competitive and come with many strings. And just because you might be able to get grant money doesn't necessarily mean you always should. So we need to make sure that whatever we do, we do we do we do it in, in a thoughtful manner. Um, but that said, I do believe that there's. Uh, value in bringing in a grant writer. I believe the position likely would pay for itself. And, um, and I think it's worth doing. So or, or certainly worth reevaluating this year. We haven't looked at it in a couple of years. Um, I will also say just real quick on the sustainability coordinator. I have had some conversations with a few people uh, who believe that there might very well be um, grant opportunities to help fund that position. And there's a chance that it itself could be fully funded through a grant, especially where we're doing this in a regional manner. Uh, a lot of the granting agencies like to, um, like to see uh, regional, regional approaches, uh, regional solutions to things. So uh, we're hopeful that that would actually end up being fully, fully grant funded, but we won't know that until we're able to apply for it. And that's my presentation. Nancy, if you'd go back to the original budget slide, uh, the first budget slide, if you will. Okay. Um, uh, it's the hour is late. The 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 font is small, but uh, if you can bear with me, uh, let me just first highlight the numbers that are different here than. Uh, what was uh, in your book or in the Dropbox. And Nancy, I don't know if you have a yellow highlighter that you can actually highlight this slide in real time, but on the fiscal year 23 department requests column, uh, the third number down 353,616, that's, uh, that's a new number 
uh, I guess it can't be done on this uh, page, but uh, it's it's on the pages that were emailed around uh, tonight. And that number is highlighted for you. And so the actual number for wages full time is three hundred fifty three thousand six hundred sixteen. The uh, second item to be corrected is the next line. I, I take a, not the next line, two lines down which uh, is $133,298. This is clerical services full-time. Uh, Nancy is uh, tr trying to highlight it for us, but uh, this, this program is not cooperating with her. And, uh, and go down to the total of select board salaries. That correct number is there, 690. 511, $690,511. dollars um, The total number there, 690511 is an increase of $32,029 or 4.9% over fiscal 22 revised budget. Uh, the increases you'll see there are uh, $23,617 13.6% in the increase in the town administrator's salary, administrator's salary uh, well deserved. You'll note if you go back in time that he uh, didn't get an increase in, uh, uh, from 21 to, uh, uh, to 22. Um, total wages uh, full-time increased by $2,541.7% and clerical service full-time increased by $5,872 or 4.6%. Uh, the final note on that is the town administrator's salary is established by an individual contract negotiated by the select board. The uh, requested budget for expenses totals $116,340. There's no change in that number or in any of the expense numbers uh, from the uh, documents that you originally received. All the expenses are the same. That, that number of $116,340 is a decrease of $2,250 or 1.9% from the fiscal 22 revised budget. Um, the, uh, the most significant of the reductions is in a $4,000 decrease in in-state travel, uh, obvious during a time of a pandemic and people's uh, uh, increase in use of Zoom. Uh, the, the total budget <clears throat> at the bottom changes. Uh, so it is 800, the correct number is as is shown on this sheet, $806,851, uh, which I beg your pardon, which is an increase of $29,779 or 3.8% over fiscal uh, 22 revised budget. What was the and percentage? I'm sorry, Andy. I beg your pardon? What was the percentage you offered? I'm sorry. It was uh, of the total. The total budget is a 3.8 percent uh, increase over 22 revised budget. So with that, I hand it back to the chair. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Tom, for going through the slides and making your presentation. Does anyone have any questions tonight about the um, select board budget? Know it's late, but um, I questions? swear I didn't do that on purpose, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julie, we're all just like lulled at sleep. Sorry, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I, I want to make one comment that while we acknowledge what Tom said is certainly true, that the town administrator and the two ATAs uh, certainly support us, and you know, as they do all the other departments, we do know where our bread is buttered and. Uh, Sue Nickerson, of course, is uh, <laughs> where the... <laughs> That's right. 
Sorry, she's our favorite. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, uh, Daveline has her hand raised. So this isn't really a question, it's a comment. Um, and I know this is the additional request, so we won't vote on this tonight, but I think the sustainability um, director position is just very important, both because of issues around climate change and also around climate justice, a little different idea maybe. Um, but I also think there's a lot, if, if we are serious about the actions we took at town meeting last year on net zero, and we really are serious about climate change, to have somebody whose job it is, is to really help lead us through that effort and provide professional support um, so that we're not just relying on volunteers. I mean, volunteers are great. We're a great committee, but volunteers are limited in terms of there are other things that we do. So I just wanna put my support behind that, that position. And if it's paid for, by grants, that's wonderful. If it's initially, and maybe for, for maybe that will work out forever, shared with another town, that's great. But I think it's an important step to be making. And so I just want to put my my sort of two cents in on that. Thank you. Thanks, Dave Lynn. And I would like to add that um, the advisory committee and you all received copies of it, received many emails from people in town in support of adding a sustainability director position. So we uh, I just want to note that we saw the emails and we heard we heard from people. So, Nancy, um, I just had a question about that position um, and the shared expense with Cohasset. Is that is that another um, expense that will show up on the the budget for the select board? And then that reimbursement from Cohasset is that going to go back into the general fund? <laughs> A great question. Probably a good one for Sue, although I'm sure she'd say we could set it up a number of different ways. But I would believe that, yeah, I think we're going to have to budget the whole. Um, well, Sue, any ideas? I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get um, out of there. Well, since we're only asking for two thirds of it, um, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I always, I, I thought actually that the person would be paid from Cohasset. Um, you know, I, th I think what we'll have to do is 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 budget the seventy two thousand, and then offset it with the balance coming from Cohasset. I don't know how else the, for that person like they, they've got to get paid. They've got to pay taxes. They, they've got to they, they've got to you know do their whole the, yeah, their best. So it, it, it would be it would be the same as you know with Shrek. You know, I mean, yep. we're, we're, we're uh, no, but, but my thing, point but is. My, yeah, but minus what they're going to pay. So ultimately, you're only going to fund the two thirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My point is more that it's just additional going into fund balance. Yep. No, it wouldn't be. No, it wouldn't. It, it yeah. would, when we get the money from them, it would go directly to the to the employee. Right. So, so basically, Nancy, we're going to pay the person $72,000 and Cohasset's going to give us one third of that. Right. But we're only budgeting for two thirds, so it, it won't go to fund balance at all. Okay. It's more like we pay the whole salary, go in the negative, and then Cohasset yes. reimburses the third that we're in the negative for. To yeah, we'll set something up where they're paying us on a regular basis so that we're not fronting large sums we're not going to do a transfer at the end of the year we'll do it regularly throughout that's a good question nancy thank you does anyone else have any questions about the uh, select board budget brad moyer i see brad from the energy action committee and climate action planning committee correct so so i don't uh, I'm not obviously on the advisory committee, so I don't know if anyone else had questions, but I thought I'd raise my hand just in case. No, you're welcome to speak now. I don't see any other hand, so go ahead. Great, thank you. So I know the last thing you probably wanted are comments from the public after 10 o'clock, so I will make these brief. Um, but I'm here tonight, uh, 36 Wanders Drive, uh, here in my capacity as chair of the Climate Action Planning Committee uh, to 
express our support for the sustainability coordinator position. Thanks to Tom and the town administration for putting that position forward. Uh, Dave Aline, thank you for your comments. You hit the nail directly on the head. As one of those volunteers, I can tell you that uh, the sustainability coordinator position is essential if we're going to make good on the town commitment uh, that we set forth at town meeting last <clears throat> last or in the spring. Uh, so I think there are three ways to conceptualize this and, and I'll make all three brief. Uh, grants and funding, local and regional coordination and the support we have in the community for this. So if you look at the first one, grants and funding, uh, 24 greater Boston communities currently have sustainability directors or their equivalents. Um, the possibilities for funding this position with grants, as Tom noted, are quite substantial. Uh, and that can be either funded directly. So for example, the CAPC got a verbal commitment from Senator O'Connor's office uh, that he would put forward uh, an earmark for approximately 35 to 40K to fund this position. And that's something that Holliston had done. So there is a precedence for, for taking that path. Um, grant opportunities that are available, uh, both for the salaried position or just money that can come into the town can more than pay for this position over time. So for example, just looking at Green Communities alone, of which Hingham is a member, um, Green Communities program gave a total of 13 million in grants to 103 communities in 2020 uh, and 8 million to 59 communities in 2021. So you're averaging uh, a little over $130,000 roughly uh, on a per grant basis. Um, <clears throat> if you look at peer communities that uh, hang in benchmarks against, many who have been in the green communities programs over time have gotten substantial competitive grants awards. So um, if you look at, I'm just looking at my list here, Acton as one has received 574,000 in green communities grants since they joined the program in 2018. Uh, Marshfield, nearly 800,000. Norwell, nearly 340,000. Uh, Situate, over 420,000. Uh, so there's a lot of grant opportunities to come into the town, uh, but having a dedicated person uh, to understand, be connected, and go after that grant money is key to making that possible. In addition to green communities, uh, you have the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that is funding various programs for which grants are available. EV charging infrastructure grants of 6.4 billion in total, electric grid resilience of 5 billion, school bus replacement of 5 billion, and even community recycling programs. These uh, types of grants are, um, the federal government makes money available and you go at, uh, and go after it. And so having a, a person dedicated towards understanding that is key. Uh, for local and regional coordination, um, if you look at uh, how we can go about uh, achieving the goals the town set. You know, we have many town bodies that address sustainability. You have obviously the Climate Action Planning Committee, Master Plan Committee, Planning Board, Cleaner Green or Hingham, Development Industrial Committee, Energy Action, so on and so forth. Uh, but we all play in, in little different areas. Uh, we all have day jobs and, and do work at night like you are right now. Uh, and so having someone embedded in town administration that can play a quarterbacking and coordinating role uh, would be extremely helpful for moving all of these initiatives forward and ensure that they are coordinated and working together. Uh, as Tom noted, too, regional coordination is uh, highly desired by grant bodies. Uh, we've seen that time and again, both at the Energy Action Committee and at the CAPC. Uh, and so having someone uh, on the town who will be uh, essentially hooked into those coordinating bodies is helpful. Um, for example, if you look at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, of which we are a member, um, they do a, a lot of great work in infrastructure and investment and climate planning and host multiple events and ha also have their own grant opportunities. Uh, and so this role is something that could uh, coordinate with MAPC to the town's benefit. Uh, and lastly, Julie, as you noted, there were many emails and letters. Um, I could go down the list, but won't bore you unless you want me to. There are over 14 formal groups within town that have endorsed this role. Uh, and we are in discussions with many other bodies to continue that endorsement. So there's certainly a groundswell of opinion uh, in favor of this role. So I think between the grant funding, the coordination possibilities and the community support, uh, I think there's uh, it's almost a no brainer uh, for adding this position to this budget. So thank you. 
All right, thanks, Brad. While you're here, Brad, I have a quick question. Uh, maybe sure. you could help me answer it or um, Tom or Michelle, but I was wondering about the availability of a type of person who would who would do this job. Like, is it the kind of um, one of those things where it's hard to get people to do this kind of job with that specific skill set that you're looking for, or do you happen to know any information about that? So it's a good question. I'll note that the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant just hired Brianna Brett uh, as a sustainability position. So they obviously found uh, someone in short order. Uh, I happen to know a former Hingham resident and former member of the Energy Action Committee uh, who played a role in Dedham for many years um, and um, is now living in Cohasset and currently looking at a position of this type. You know, uh, so I know people are out there uh, and I know uh, there is interest in it. Um, while the Climate Action Planning Committee is currently um, putting forward a proposal for um, a consultant to aid it in its efforts that's generously funded by HMLP. Uh, one of our potential pitches is for any part-time position, should this role be added to, to hang them in the next budget cycle, could segue right over into that. Um, so there's possibilities to pitch this and make this work. Thank you. And then yep. sort of a follow up to if, if any, if you know, or if anyone knows the HMLP, they hired their own state sustainability um, uh, position. Is it, has it been found at all that there could be ever any kind of overlapping um, where a person from HMLP could do some consulting work for it and do that role a little bit for the town of Hingham or is it just that that person is completely full of things to do for HMLP and couldn't do anything on the, on the town side? Yeah, I couldn't answer as to all that HMLP has planned for that person. It's something, and they're very new to the position. So obviously it's something I wanna understand and find out. But um, considering that there are many uh, energy um, uh, sources other than electricity in town, there will be plenty of work for uh, a Hingham Sustainability Coordinator to work with those um, uh, bringing those bodies into a net zero uh, mindset as opposed to just an HMLP, which is going to be focused more on the electrific electrification component. So yeah, there's definitely potential for coordination and maybe possibilities of even some overlap, but certainly in the short to midterm, there's plenty of work for both of them to do independently. Okay. Well, thanks, Brad, for your, um, for your input. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Tom or Michelle, do you want to add anything or does anyone else have any other questions? I'm good, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. So those additional requests aside, um, Andy, can you give us a recommendation for the uh, select board budget? I recommend for the select board budget for fiscal 23, uh, a total for salaries of $690,511 for expenses, $116,340 uh, for a total budget, operating budget of $806,851. All right, thank you. All right, that concludes our budget hearings for tonight. Whoa, that went much longer than I thought <laughs> that it would. But I guess they're all pretty meaty budgets and um, Really, our only final outstanding budget is the water company, which we'll hear from at some point uh, coming up soon, I hope. And um, so if we all can be extremely brief, we can run through quickly the next agenda item, which, um, oh, wait a minute, let me back up. The next agenda item is a vote on a gender neutral, uh, I mean the handbook, uh, but we can't do that because the um, select board needs to still take its vote on the bylaws changes and they are doing that on Thursday. So we will push that agenda item to a future ADCOM meeting. And um, liaison updates, George. Uh, thanks, Julie. Uh, sustainable Budget Task Force is um, 
on the verge of wrapping up their work with a uh, an anticipated presentation to the select board on the 25th of this month. Okay, since I'm here, can I, do you mind if I, um, George, just tonight at the select board meeting when Liz Klein did her report at the end, she noted that we are likely targeting, well, we were hoping to finish this month, it's likely gonna be a February 1st report out to the select board. Ah, okay. All right, good to know for our scheduling purposes. Hey, Nancy, do you mind turning off the screen sharing? Um, okay, that's good to know. Um, all right, so ACEs and George, do you have anything else or are you all set? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Dave or anyone on ACEs? Thanks, Michelle. Thanks um, for oh, Tom. I, yeah, I'm, forgive me, because I'm not, I, quite sure what you guys covered on ACES last week. We do now have a draft budget from the school committee. It's, um, to be frank, I'm still trying to kind of get my head around exactly what's in it. Uh, the headline growth is down uh, for people familiar with historical growth, but I think it's a little bit, misleading is the wrong word, but I think it takes some parsing because there's some changes in some special ed line items, uh, reductions in special ed line items that uh, kind of offset some increases elsewhere that make the overall growth rate look a little bit lower. But um, obviously the integration of that budget and in particular the, the subsequent years of budgets will be a key piece of the Sustainable Budget Task Force. So we've got some concurrent efforts going on with uh, that group as well as what uh, we will ultimately take up at, at ACES and then here as well. And, uh, and then just quickly, for anybody who's interested, there will be a the third of um, third of at least three, possibly four budget uh, hearing nah, budget meetings related uh, budget related meetings for the school committee on Thursday night at seven o'clock. Aces has a posted meeting for that. Um, it will I think it will be recorded, but people who want to uh, attend are welcome to do so. Just check the website for the Zoom info. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to the ACES group for keeping an eye on the budget process for the school budget. Um, Evan, you had something for Harbor Development? Yeah, just the net is, I'm Liz Klein and I met with um, Marco Bohr and um, Bill, whose last name I'm forgetting right now, Reardon, um, late last week. And there will be uh, a warrant article put in. Uh, the net net is, um, you know, construction prices have gone up. There's some level of concern that um, the existing um, funds that were granted in last year's town meeting won't be enough to um, achieve the, the, you know, town peer. Um, 100 year or 30, or I think it's 100, 30 year flood line, you know, improvements. So there'll be a warrant article to probably bridge um, uh, the work. The bids are supposed to come in in April. They would start work, want to start work in June. Not sure if that's entirely feasible, but there's a bunch going uh, on down in the harbor front. So um, net, net, there'll be a warrant article this, this season for that. All right. Thanks, Evan. Nancy, do you want to give a quick update on CPC? Uh, yeah, CPC met last night. Um, at, last week. Thank you, last week. <laughs> <laughs> All running together. Um, and did the final votes of um, what they are going to um, propose to the, um, the select board and to ADCOM to go into the warrant. Um, there was at least full, at least partial funding, if not full funding for um, six different, well, five different projects and then their administrative fees. So um, the, there's the, the debt payments for the Laner land, the Ben Lincoln house, the new projects are supporting the Habitat for Humanity houses that are going up on Whiting Street um, for the pool at the country club and for the Cronenfield Hockey Court. 
Okay. And then, um, and then just so that everybody uh, is aware that we are meeting um, jointly with the select, um, the select board, ADCOM, and CPC um, to hear their final presentation, recommendation presentation, and that's on the 27th. And did you, is that confirmed with, um, with the CPC? I let Larry know, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. So that would be a special Thursday night hearing uh, that advisory committee would be part of. Yes. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, and he, I can't even say it, my, I'm so tired. I can't even say the word. Hang on me to a light plant. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Brenda. Last Friday's, uh, yeah, at last Friday's light board meeting, um, they reported that uh, the, I think at the request of the select board uh, that light plant is not going to go ahead and ask for funding for building the new transmission line and the second substation. So only the Warren article about transferring land from the town to HMLP will be on this year's warrant. And the reason is that the amount of work that needs to be done to get this all permitted can start as soon as the land is transferred and the funding is not needed for another year. So I think the request was to not have too many large debt exclusions on the same, same warrant, so. All right, great, thank you. Okay, so I have on the agenda warrant article process discussion. The only thing I just wanna say is that um, we're just gonna kind of stick to the old style of when you're done with your um, a liaison is done with the comment and we've had the hearing and it's in a form to go to the editors. It's just gonna be an attachment to an email, in an, e in an attachment in an email to send to one of the editors. And that's how we're gonna transfer files back and forth. We're not gonna do a Dropbox or shared drive this year. We're just gonna do it like we have done in the past. And um, as soon as your article has its hearing, then you, and you have all the information you need, um, including advisory committee's vote tally, then you would need to get that comment in shape to send to the editor um, so that we don't have any traffic jams um, with uh, work piling up in the editing process. So more information on that coming. Um, discussion of advisory committee housekeeping items. So next, week uh oh andy um is the uh, as i understand it are, are we expected to have drafted the comment before the hearing on the warrant article by the adcom i could i just can't remember yes yes okay yes I had to say, think about it for a second, but yes, you, you get the article and you do the research on it and you write a draft of the comment and you give that comment ahead of time to the full advisory committee to review ahead of the meeting, which is the hearing. And then we'll go through, the liaison will go through the comment and explain the article and all sides of the issue and then get input from advisory committee on ways to make that comment better. And then, that liaison will do an update on to the comment draft. And um, then we will, help me, Bob, do we go back and you show, show it to advisory committee again or just send it on to the editors? I, I think that's an, it depends. Uh, I think yeah. many times the comment is, you know, 95% or 98% in agreement with the general consensus of the ADCOM, in which case, if there are relatively minor edits, that it just goes on to the editors um, uh, because it doesn't really merit further ADCOM review of fairly minor things. But especially on those articles where uh, perhaps there is a majority position and a minority position and where language is important, you know, it may be beneficial to bring it back to um, the EDCOM for, you know, a, a further discussion on the comment. I mean, we're, 
we are probably going to look at some of the most important articles that the town of Hingham has seen in the last 12 or more years in terms of the budget and override, um, debt exclusions, all of which are completely in our ballpark. And I think we probably want to give the most careful attention to the language we put before the town meeting so that in, in that kind of it depends situation, um, I mean, maybe the first draft will be so wonderful that nobody has any comments uh, uh, about changes, in which case it goes on to the editor. Yeah. But um, to the extent that there is significant discussion, um, it uh, probably is useful to bring it back to the AdCom. And okay. it's, it's certainly been my experience that thought time is valuable and that um, uh, a, a week or a few days, you know, may add something of value. And I'll stop there. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. You've explained it very well and refreshed us on, and it's going to be, you know, you'll know it. You'll know it if you need to go back and do more work on the comment and bring it back to AdCom. So it'll be, we'll, we'll, you'll know it. We'll know it. Andy, yes. When we circulate, do we individually circulate the comment to all of the board or do we send it to you and have you circulate it? You can send it out. Okay. The individual okay. liaison can send it out to the full committee. If you want me to send it because I have the best mailing list, I'll do that. But you don't I need me as the mailman for that. I, I know who um, they are and where they live. So okay. So um discussion of advisory question. committee house. Yeah. Quick question. There have been a couple of meetings, um, budget meetings that I've been in where um, department heads have said that um, they might work with capital outlay or it might become a Warren article. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna know about those pretty soon for what we are responsible yeah. for. Yes, so on the on Warren Thursday. will close, it's supposed to close on Thursday. And um, we already have the first list of uh, perennials that I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about in one second. Um, so we're, we have the, um, the, the select board is meeting on Thursday to go through the, the first batch of articles, the perennials. And um, so we'll know very soon about the rest of the articles and then we'll divide them up. Thanks. Um, so the next meeting, as we just heard late breaking news, we are not meeting jointly with the select board and um, the uh, school committee next Tuesday. However, because the, um, the select board is meeting on Thursday to go through the perennials, we are going to have our meeting next Tuesday and we're going to go through the perennial articles. So I got a list today of what those articles are and I'm going to divide them up and send them out to our um, to the full ad so everyone knows what's going on, but to the perennials go to the um, the newest members on adcom. So I'll um, help you through that and I will send that tomorrow, I promise. And the idea is that you get the article and it'll have the language and then you call or email the, I'll give you the name of the adcom member who worked on that article last year. And then you call them and say, what did you do? And then you look at the warrant from last year and. It's going to be pretty straightforward, I promise. Um, one, more, one more comment. So, yeah. Um, maybe for next year, we should drop all the finished articles into a Dropbox. Just a thought. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, could, we could do that. Um, I love the idea of innovation. Just, I can't think about that right now. So That's fine. That's you. just easier and contacting people someday in the future. The 1030 rule has um, to be invoked. Okay. <laughs> now. 
I know. I remember the days we went to midnight sometimes. So shush. Not, but not anyway, this is easy stuff. Um, so finally, matters. So we are going to meet next Tuesday. And then we, I'm going to get confirmation tomorrow. And I will let you know that we'll probably meet next Thursday as well for our joint meeting uh, to hear the CPC projects. Dabeline, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say, because you mentioned that what we haven't heard yet in budget, we also haven't heard the Harbor Master's budget as a matter of public safety. And that will be on February yes. 1st because he's out of, uh, out of town this week. So I just didn't want somebody yes. to think we'd miss that. Yes, thanks for pointing that out, Dabeline. And yeah, so it's the Harbor Master, yes. And then the water, water budget, which I might have more information after tomorrow about uh, when we can hear that budget. Um, so just finally in matters not anticipated within 48 hours of meeting, I just would like to give a quick update on tonight's select board meeting. The reason why I was late to start our ADCOM meeting and we had um, George assume the mantle of chair and I bet he did a fantastic job and he mm. uh, really enjoyed doing that, George, mm -hmm. right? Um, so thank you for coming over to start our meeting. Um, so the select board um, invited the school building committee to discuss its plans for a warrant article for <laughs> annual town meeting. And they had, uh, that committee had been working pretty diligently on a vigorous timeline for the design of the new foster school so that they could ask annual town meeting for a full appropriation for the construction budget because they were concerned that they might not be able to open the school, complete the building and open the school in the fall of 24. Uh, this timeline, however, um, would have been a little out of order on the usual order of business with the MSBA because they like, usually they have a final vote on the project and then the town would have its own um, uh, approval of the project and um, the MSBA isn't having that vote until August 31st. So uh, there may be some changes to the uh, plans of the school building committee in terms of the spring's annual town meeting they may come um, with a different article, perhaps for interim funding to keep their work going forward until a special town meeting in the fall. But I just wanted to let you know that things are moving in that um, and perhaps changing with um, that project. So um, that's all I have tonight. Could I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, roll call vote. Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Evan? Aye. Andy? Aye. Dabeline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Mm, we lost out. Okay, Tina? Aye. Matt? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Aye.